Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming for fourth RDMA mini conference. Uh, we will start from uh, memory-specific topics, uh, but uh, don't be afraid. It's going to be related to RDMA and related to a block device and so something um, so other similar and uh, similar subsystem to us. A first talk is going to be presented by three people from three different companies. Uh, Jason from Mellanox, uh, Don from Red Hat and uh, John from, uh, from NVIDIA. So it's actually a joint work to improve and connect RDMA to the memory management and to uh, complex devices like uh, GPU devices to share uh, memory all together over RDMA. So it's going to be exciting session, long session, uh, and we are expecting a lot of questions from, from you. Uh, let's, start. let's start. All right, so we, uh, we titled this, I think we allocated like 40 minutes or an hour for this, the, this topic hour. of an hour for the, the perennially complicated topic of zone device and get user pages and how do we want to fit all this together into the subsystem. So we've got a couple of slides to kind of help the audience catch up if you're not totally familiar with all these things. So the kernel now has this thing called zone device, which Dan here created some time ago. <laughs> he, he doesn't want to take responsibility for this, but uh, I, I think it was created for DAX, right? It was created for it was created for get user pages for for VMAM, for persistent memory. Okay. And then everybody and then everybody found lots of other uses cases lots for of, it. Lots of other use cases. So so first it was for DAX, which is I, I suppose the FS DAX and Dev DAX um, items on the slide there. And then I, I'm not sure which came next. I think Jerome added device private for HMM and and Logan, who's not here, added uh, PCI P2P DMA, which was for which is um, we're going to start talking about next is for transfers between two PCI devices in the same system. Um, and, and you can kind of view zone device, uh, this is how I've kind of been viewing it, it's an alternative to using the VMIO and VFN, um, PFN map flags when you, when you insert pages to user space, because we're, we're going to start primarily talking about user space at this point. Uh, and, and really, I think the main motivation for having zone device pages at all has to do with interacting with user space. If you were solely in the kernel, there's less reasons why you'd need to have them. So this is, this is kind of my master diagram to try and explain what it is that we're trying to do. And I'm going to go stand over here and, and look at the camera, and it'll be good. <laughs> so uh, the goal here is to enable this red line. So this is a, an RDMA from the network, and it goes through the, the NIC, goes only through the PCI, and ends up directly on something like an NVMe. So this red line is what we're trying to do. And today, you can't do that red line because there's no way to connect the RDMA driver with the VFIO driver in the kernel. There's no way to exchange those special information about the bar pages to set up all the pieces that are needed into here. So the concept is we'd have a single user space process that's kind of shown in the middle that's doing VFIO and RDMA together. Uh, on the VFIO side, it's getting bar pages through MMAP. And we want to use a flow where we're creating zone device pages for them with the existing P2P DMA add resources uh, inspired flow. And then instead of using PFN map, we're using insert page. So there's actual struct pages behind the VMA. And that would allow the RDMA side to pick up the struct pages, get the information that tells all the rest of the system about how to route those P2Ps out of the struct pages and then configure its IOMU and use the DMA API and so forth. So we can have this kind of whole circle of communication using struct pages in the kernel side and then communication with raw TLPs bypassing the system memory on the, on the interconnect side. So uh, We're getting pretty close to having all the pieces to do this, but I think there's still a few tricky, tricky bits left. I think the next slide is for Don, who's been working on the <coughs> VFIO part of this. So. Um, thanks, Jason. Um, so I'm going to go over here like we were instructed. Um, 
So we decided to pick the NVMe because A, they're easy to get to and it's something we can play around and use as space even though we started the talk saying we're gonna do GPUs because they're a lot more complicated and harder so we figured we'd learn to walk before we gallop. Um, so it's the VFIO change is pretty simple. It was just a new iOctal and we basically did what uh, some of the NVMe drivers doing which is called peer-to-peer -peer DMA create or add and therefore we hooked up, as um, Jason mentioned in the previous slide, the struct pages, which is what you need to do so you can um, do DMA mapping without a struct page. It doesn't know how to translate one user address to a physical address. So that's really the crux of the VFIO work. It was a simple, quick, easy way to do it. Although um, yesterday afternoon, one of the fun things of working with multiple people from multiple companies is we have lots of great ideas and hopefully that's what we're looking to get here. We actually had a debate over some issues and stuff and now we're toying the idea of running this mostly through SysFS and not use much of EFIO. So if anyone has comments of pros, cons, yays, nays, whatever in that space, yeah, I, I'd like to hear it. So I, one of the people I wish was here is Logan, so I wanted to ask him, where's Logan? So Logan, <laughs> Logan's not, Logan's coming to Europe for Austria in a few weeks, we don't want to come to Canada. Um, I think it would be a good question for kind of the audience is, is how do we want to deal with the problem that we don't always get zone device pages, apparently. This, this is what I've, I've been told, and maybe, maybe Dan knows more about this. I don't know where the other catch box went. It's right there. Uh, yeah. right there, there. So, I, I recall a discussion between Logan and I think it was Benjamin Herdeschmidt from PowerPC when Logan was adding the P2P stuff where the PowerPC guys were kind of saying that they couldn't support what Logan was doing. Uh, it, it, it might, oh, so I, I haven't been following what, 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 uh, what PowerPC's issues are with that, but it, it might be this fact that we have this PTE flag called PTE DevMap all it does is tell get user pages. Oh, by the way, you got to get your you got to pin your pages a, a slightly different way. But um, I have I have plans to try to kill that flag so that and this will probably make it easier for S three ninety and other architectures to support zone device without needing to spend a, a PTE flag on on this uh, use case. So I, I think there's a couple things. I, I think you need memory hot plug enabled in your architecture. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know how broad that is across the kernel. It's, that's what PowerPC is missing. You think PowerPC is missing? Yeah, it's missing. No. It isn't? That's what I thought. I saw it. Well, it's missing the hook for it. Right? Okay. So, like, definitely PowerPC has some support for zone device pages. Yeah. Like, for example, for persistent memory, PowerPC does support persistent memory, and it does support zone device stuff and stuff like that. So, so definitely there is some basic support. I'm not sure what was the problem. Uh, it with I support sparse memory. I mean sparse memory map. Yes. yes. Okay. So that I, you need I, that too. I was left with the impression, and this was a while ago, like last year when this conversation oh. happened, that it had to do with, with the, adver the physical address of the bar pages. Because of the way PowerPC laid out its memory map, there was a gigantic gap between okay. system memory and the bar pages, and this caused them some sort of grief. <coughs> this right. I don't know, but... It shouldn't be a problem is, with sparse is, memory map. Is, is this also, because uh, we... One of the problems with zone devices is it, it assumes that it assumes you want the linear map because that's what you wanted for persistent memory, but, but we don't want the linear map for for bar pages. So I wonder if that's where they're running. Maybe, issues. maybe. Uh, that could be. But we, yeah, but but we certainly eliminate that. Like, there's no need. There's no need to have a linear map for this stuff. Okay. Certainly, Ben is running somewhere in the hallway. Yes, I, I saw Ben around earlier. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, and uh, for the purposes of the video recording, if you're talking, please stand up so you can get in the video. And hold the mic like this. <laughs> like this whole, you know, very, yeah, oh, well, a little higher. There you go. Just like this. You know, right, right, right at the chest bone. Uh, um, okay, but just as a general question, can we assume that we can create, do the, the PCI, the PCI P2P DMA ad resources, can, can we assume that'll work broadly on most systems? Or is this something that's going to work on a subset of our architectures? It's going to work on uh, ARM x86 and PowerPC, not S390 right now. S390 is the uh, issue on PowerPC, which is a sub arc of. PowerPC is, sorry? S390 is slightly different than the rest of PowerPC. Okay. 
PowerPC, S390 is slightly different than the rest of PowerPC. I didn't know that. I didn't even know it was related to PowerPC. <laughs> so that shows you how much I know about this stuff. Uh, OK. So when Don was talking about an IO control for VFIO, the purpose was the thinking that we don't want to enable these zone device pages unconditionally, because there's a lot of systems that don't want them. And it takes a lot of memory to set them up. And then there's architectures where it isn't going to work still. And so there's a discussion about how should we, how should we do this. And it's kind of, we started with maybe an IO control for VFIO made sense. And it, it does make sense in a VFIO only context. But when you start to say, well, we want all kinds of other drivers to participate this too. And maybe we need, this is where we were getting to, maybe we need a yeah. more. Uh, well, the big problem you had is you wanted to enable it for the entire bar for every device. And I'm like, yeah, that will just Well, no, not every device. That. So but we, we, there definitely has to be a, um, you know, a per bar and maybe a per sub bar issue that we've seen to have heard multiple times, as well as you may have a bar that you want to partition across multiple users. So that's the other issue. And VFIO right now is geared for an all or none situation, right? You own the whole device or you don't own the device and it doesn't partition the device across multiple users. So you, you know, um, so that's not possible. That may not be as flexible. So that's another reason why we're looking at the SysFS where we can look at it more at a resource level or, uh, you know, in a resource, not necessarily being a bar, but a piece of a bar that's defined be a CMB or something like that. So that's what we're kind of struggling with right now. How, how big are these bars? I think um, like a Mellanox bar is like 64 <laughs> meg, 100 megabytes. I don't know what a GPU bar is like. Yeah, it depends a bit on the enterprise GPUs. Um, we're going to size the bar, or we have done it uh, to cover the whole vidmem, which can be, you know, 24 gigs. 24 gigs. I mean, yeah, but so. we're, st we're, not, we're not talking about terabytes here, so it's not like this. So right. are we really get running out of struct page space? Well, if you start asking how many GPUs do you put on a high end HPC and then do it all, we're talking six. I mean, I've seen presentations of 16 of these things. So 16 times whatever, what'd you say? 24, but, but 24. so it's going to get worse. So there is like GPU on the, on the, on the horizon with percent of memory. So we will have HPM, GDR, percent of memory. And then we're going to grow in the range of terabyte. Yeah, so it's but the PCI Express bar is not expected to be that big. I uh, don't think so, at least. So, so anyhow, that it could get large. So we don't want to create this nice architecture and then we just tip everything over on. Well, I, I do want to mention that, you know, per device, it's each device will probably be, you know, 20, 30, 60 gigs, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not still it's still manageable. But it's just, yeah, if you multiply them all together, now you've got a lot of bar space right. in, in aggregate. I just want to Well, the clarify. issue is the aggregate of, you know, device structs. Right. Or, or I, page, I also think that we, for device that we all, I think a lot of us kind of broadly agree that we need some kind of future where we don't have to have struct pages for bars, but we as yet, how to get there is a little unclear. So this injecting struct pages is, you know, kind of the walking step. We put the struct pages in, we, we build the use case, we demonstrate all the places where it wants to be, and then, you know, then maybe it will be more clear how we can remove the struct page from this flow at all, because we don't really need the struct page. We, we could probably make it work with a different VMA flag in a lot of cases that says it's, it's bar memory or something. I don't know, but. Yeah, that was another discussion we had across the three companies, and we were trying to do a discussion about that. And we said, well, to get there, we would love to get right to that point, but it'd be really hard. So that's why we want to thank Dan for struck pages. <laughs> so it's our, yeah, it's yeah, at yeah, least yeah, a step pages. to get us there, and we're trying to figure out that how to said, get That said, if somebody has a really good idea how to just avoid the struck page step, you know, we could... Oh, definitely. I mean, I mean, but and and that's where that's where we started. We started with the idea like, there's no way we're going to be able to allocate struct page for these this, this huge persistent persistent memory range, and then we ran into issue after issue after compatibility after right. talking other subsystems, and then we said, well, I, so let's let's just try this own device thing. It'll be a it'll be a band aid, and it's been a five year band aid, um, <laughs> and and so I'm uh, I I, I kind of lost the faith on struct page removal, and and I'm I'm more excited by maybe ideas about making it less um, expensive. Less expensive. Like, like maybe could we make zone device always be huge pages and, and 
build that kind of assumption in somewhere. And yeah, that, well, that's where I was wondering, can we go to huge page? Yeah, that, 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 would, that sounds fantastic. But, so. but, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's, that's also, also just kind of like well, a, we not, not a very f fleshed out idea. We have two DMA zones. Can't we have two the big, <laughs> things, you know, the big ones? And so the one? I think what Dan just explained is like, DAX has already been here. DAX has already tried to do without struct pages, and it just didn't work for DAX. So we're not nearly as well resourced as DAX. So I don't want to, I don't want to fight that fight yet either. <laughs> but I mean, we can see it coming. Jo John is right here. We, we're going to have hundreds of GPUs or whatever, and terabytes of GPU bar memory in ridiculous systems. So this is probably going to end up being a problem in the end. Okay. So. That's, so, that's well, what I really can add uh, about the VIA Maybe that's one the comment like, like about the reducing. So, so the problem with DAX, why, why, why it was difficult to get rid of struct page, was that uh, you have quite a bit of memory management code and block layer code that are used to normal pages, and you need to reuse all those for DAX because that's, that's the resistant memory is just another kind of storage. So you basically want to behave it just like another SSD. And uh, so it's not obvious that the argument like translates to what you need to do with peer peer to peer bars, yeah? Because there you basically the memory and the bar memory is going to be mostly contained within the drivers, as far as I understand. Well, it no, it it goes out to user space. It gets into a VMA. <coughs> From a VMA, it can touch all other all the MM stuff theoretically, and, and we can block it off in certain places. But yeah, I mean. As soon as you block something off, somebody else stands up and says, "No, oh, I really need that." Yeah, but, well. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to point out what was the problem with DAX and. Why. I, I think you're right. I think it's a lot simpler. Oh, I want to switch my I think it's. I think it's a lot simpler than the DAX problem because we don't have a file. A file system is never going to be working with these pages, as far as I know. I think. I think we can say that with clarity. I hope. <laughs> you know, I say that, but then I also have visions of someone using Fuse or something on these things, so I don't know. Uh, that, was, that was on camera. That was on camera, okay. But the... <laughs> so, because we're using... I, I guess the, the whole, this whole conversation started is because we're using struct page, we have an uncertainty that we might not be able to create them, so we need to have some sort of mechanism for the, use, the administrator to say, hey, I actually want to do peer-to-peer -peer DMA on these devices, turn it on. And that is where we were kind of struggling um, recently. So SysFS, I like the SysFS idea, some sort of thing in the PCI core where you can say, this guy is enabled for P2P, and <laughs> some, you know, the drivers pick up on that and do, do the right thing. Because the driver needs to be aware. It needs to, ins it needs to know their struct pages, and it needs to insert them in the VMAs using some other call, not remap, PFN or IO remap PFN or, or whatever we're using in the driver today. So, uh, yes. Just a, a question. Do you want to map the page CPU accessible, the PCI yes. Express bar? Yes. So do you know this, and do you want to do that for a regular VMA, like anonymous well, VMA? We're already doing that. This, this is how VFIO works. This is how RDMA works. You do mmap on their char devs, and you get back bar pages. Yeah, but so you do mmap of a device file. Yes, a map of a chart app is how I think all these flows work. Yeah, so, so if, if it's a map of a device file, I'm fine, but if you want to map this page inside an anonymous VMA or, okay. That's, that's, not, that's not the picture I put up, right? Okay. So I understand yeah, that maybe GPU guys are more <laughs> interested in that, I don't know. No, 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 we don't want to do that because uh, on, PC, on PCI Express bar, on PCI Express, you don't have cache currency, you don't have, so it's undefined. Right. If you right. do a, a CPU atomic operation on a PCI Express bar, and if you go look at the specification of PCI Express bar, it's, it specifically say it's undefined, the result is undefined. On some CPU x86, some old x86, it's gonna actually lock up the full system so you're gonna lose all your CPU, which means you lose all your operating there's system. No, no, and there's like, no, yeah. There's no collision between old x86 and this technology. Yeah. Right. This yeah. takes a very recent. Sorry, I'm holding the mic and I'm not even doing it. So this take, uh, my argument is we don't have to worry about old x86 <laughs> because there is no x, old x86 that this well, stuff is gonna work it on. So. It doesn't matter. We've been doing VFIO for a long, long time. Right. RDMA is doing it for a long, long time. Bar pages, uncacheable memory, bar right. pages in system processes is standard in right. the kernel at but this point. That was another feature of the zone device and it was that it, right. it tagged it as the same sort of uncacheable device memory space and had those attributes all right. built into the whole 
thing. So again, thanks, Dan. Okay. Well, I, I mean, does the audience have any opinion on the how we should be configuring this? Any ideas? Um, like I said I like the Sisyphus thing. It's new. We only thought about it yesterday. I actually know Sisyphus. Yes. <laughs> okay. There we go. Easy peasy. Oh, there we go. Look at that consensus. <laughs> You're up the hook, Sis Al. <laughs> yeah. Alex says yay. <laughs> All right. Cross don't cross the streams. <laughs> don't don't look don't look at the catch boxes. Uh, so th and the other thing I wanted <laughs> the other thing I, I wanted to point out that I discovered last week is that VFIO already has a mechanism to do P to P apparently, uh, but it just doesn't worry about struct pages or safety or security, and it directly looks into the PFN map VMAs and just DMA maps, whatever's in there, which is <laughs> so far from okay. Uh, so, I mean, we already have a user in the kernel that, that needs this functionality that we're talking about for correctness. Um, I, I think there's a very strong motivation to do all of these things. And okay, struct pages. So where were we going next? Uh, so here's, the, so here's sort of the general um, sequence of things as I see it is in terms of trying to get patches out there. So Don is working on a VFIO patch to allow VFIO to do its bar pages with uh, the device P2P. So instead of PFN map, it switches to normal struct pages and their zone device P2P DMA pages. Uh, RDMA is getting pretty close to being able to use HMM range fault for its ODP thing. And for the, you know, there's, there's more talking about this in, in the next section, but HMM range fault is kind of a parallel to get user pages. Is everyone familiar with ODP? Oh, well, it is the RDMA miniconf. So uh, ODP, for those of you not in the RDMA community, this is sort of um, a way to avoid page pinning. It, the device can take a fault when it wants to touch a page if it's not been mapped to the device, which allows the CPU to remap it to a new address. So the underlying VMA page mappings can change dynamically and the device can keep track of them. So in, in a practical sense, if you M map something in your process, DMA to it, then M unmap it and M remap something else there, it's the DMA still works, which is not how RDMA has historically worked with its classical MRs. So with HMM range fault, we have sort of this more contained get user pages that we could add in knowledge about device P2P. It already has knowledge about zone device pages. It can be enhanced a little bit more to, to support more cases. And then we would teach the RDMA driver how to understand whatever it's doing. <laughs> and I believe the IOMMU drivers are already okay. People keep telling me they're okay. I think they're okay. And Logan tells me that we need a little bit more information to determine if the pair, if like the source and target PCI device themselves are acceptable for P2P. So this is, does it go through, does the interconnect in its path support P2P? Yeah, it's a distance call. Yeah, this is Logan's distance call. Yes, yeah, so, so for, for peer to peer, maybe there is one thing to say. So you can either do peer to peer from two PCI Express device by going to uh, whatever interconnect you have on the tree on the PCI Express. But you can also do peer-to-peer -peer by going back to the root, uh, the root port, which is the IOMMU. And I believe we want to support both cases. Yeah. And so obviously the, the fastest one is when you don't go back to the root because then it's yes. a bottleneck. Well, it's least insecure. <laughs> so this, is, this has turned out to be a Sorry. really complicated Sorry. topic. And <laughs> I should say this out loud. So when you don't go up to the root port, it's the least secure because you don't have something protecting it with IOMMU. Right, so this has turned out to be a really complicated topic, and Logan, when he initially got his P2P patches <laughs> merged, um, this was like the main point of contention about how exactly you're doing this, because he started very simple. The first draft of those patches um, required a PCI switch and required ACS to be disabled. So in this case, you could take the shortcut through the, the, the root com the, the, the bypass the root complex. Right. And the reason for this is that the root complexes in, in a lot of common CPUs don't do this very well. They're either performance limited, or they just crash, or whatever. They just don't have the routes. Or they don't have the routes, or it's all, it's all kind of broken. So it, it, since then, I believe the core code for P2P has gained more and more knowledge about when it's OK to do this. So there is a call that we can make. If we know the initiating and terminating struct PCI device, we can make a call and say, is this OK, yes or no? If it is, then we can proceed. If it's not, we have to stop. Like in, in, in uh, the ODP case, we would return a permanent failure for those pages. Um, 
So hooking all of this infrastructure up is like a, a big deal too. This is why you know truck pages seem like a, a reasonable starting point is we can do all the other stuff on this list to even get us started. And then if we do want to go back and remove the truck pages, we're looking at mainly removing the H, changing something in range fault and changing something in the bar mapping that's hopefully been hoisted up into subsystem layers and there's maybe only a few of those. So uh, I see a pretty clear path where we can keep evolving this in small steps and the various people with various expertises like the IOMM use teams and the PCI people can do their parts with actual testable user space. So I, I think is very important. Um, so this is sort of all clear for everyone or do we want to talk about this anymore? All right. So I'm, I'm glad the room is so quiet because I think that means we're on the right track. You know? Better they haven't had enough caffeine. That or there's not <laughs> enough caffeine. So there is caffeine fuel fueling stations outside. You put in this weird little disc and it gives you like this tiny cup of coffee. And you're supposed to have three of them before you come to a session. Three. <laughs> three. I'm going to scream supposed to be vibrating. Uh, okay, so the next thing I wanted to use some of this time for before we go on to the next thing. So uh, I was going to ask you, like, is, it, is anybody looking at any standardization efforts in like PCI to say yes. how to communicate peer-to-peer -peer yes. capabilities? Yes. Okay. I, I am not on the PCI SIG, but I've heard like fourth hand the PCI SIG has some yeah. work ongoing to define when, I think it's when the host bridge will support this, I right. think. Yeah, so they are going to add, uh, I don't know how many bits to the PCI Express config, and this bit's going to be monetary, so like, I don't know, if, like we're talking about adding bits, but let's say, hey, my device can do peer-to-peer, -peer and my PCI Express uh, bridges, because really what, what matters is all the bridge between, you, between your device and whatever rows of device there might be. And those, basically, sometimes we do support it, sometimes we don't support it, and sometimes it depends on how the BIOS actually configure them. Uh, so we like, like we have a working group on that, basically, and we're gonna reliably report whether they su support peer to peer or not. All right. So this will be really exciting. This will improve the PCI part, the the distance calculation that was talked about earlier, <laughs> and the the distance calculator will be able to go in and use standard PCI config space to tell if it's okay or not. <coughs> I think I think the direction it's going right now, at least. You know, as an interim in the kernel, there's some kind of whitelist that says these host bridges are okay, these configurations are okay. So, so you keep talking about distance. It's not really distance that matters, though. It's that the path supports it. Yeah, this is right. But that's so, what Logan I mean, called the function, so we refer it by the function. Okay, but is there a reason that. it's called distance? Is like there a performance because issue he, with I, like again, how far it is? Or I, I mean, think uh, I, someone can correct me if they remember the patches, but. He was more worried about something simple and wondering what the distance was, and then distance got morphed into a check. Yeah, I think because okay, he sure. ran into the ACS issues, okay. and the, so he just overloaded. I'm just trying to understand. I, yeah, I, we I, I, we should probably d create a new function that's a little more descriptive. I, I and, think so. It would or be or nice build like path enabled, right? <laughs> well, path record, man. Well, uh, see, we're never we getting rid of that. So, so it, anyhow, it, I think that's what it is, but Logan's not here Logan's again. Logan's not here. So it would be we, nice if he were here because he would explain this, but I, I want to say he, the way it was set up in the kernel um, <laughs> involved using basically two NVMe drivers. Like a, The use case he was targeting is that you could have an NVMe over PCI driver and an NVMe over RDMA driver in the kernel, and they could somehow realize that they're talking to each other and they could allocate the transfer memory from the CMB of the PCI device. So the, what he was attempting to do is I would do like a, a transfer between my RDMA over, or my N NVMe over fabrics and my NVMe on PCI, and it would bypass the system memory. The transfer would simply go into the CMB, and then the device would execute it locally. So in that sense, distance made some sense because you want to choose the CMB that's local to your RDMA device, if you have multiple RDMA devices and multiple NVMe drives, as systems tend to do on multiple sockets with multiple switches, you, you kind of want to have a concept of distance. But that was <laughs> that's not where we are. We're not using that um, allocator thing that's in the kernel, the gen alloc part of the P2P DMA, because we assign them to user space. And user space is responsible for plumbing them together. And they actually are different. It's not just. CMB memory, which is kind of interchangeable. These are like registered bars from VFIO or UAR bars, uh, doorbell bars in RDMA NIC. So they're actually really, really special. And you can't 
you can't interchange them. Um, but yeah, I think we I think we'll have some new APIs coming here. I think it's necessary. Uh, I, I just view this as like the normal evolution. Um, sorry. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, I think the original distance calculation had uh, how many bridges and switches were in between. So it was more about, you know, which, which peer was closest and more about a wait for um, waiting, you know, which, which uh, bar you wanted to go to instead, assuming right. you had, you know, two interchangeable bars, basically. Yeah, I think so. I, I yeah, so the, I think what happened is if you didn't have a distance, then that meant you couldn't get to it. So that's, that's how yeah, it I, I think became that's the default chat. You know, that's how it kind of worked. No and distance it, means no connections. You know, so. it, it's also a little bit more complicated. There's a lot of complicated bits in here um, because you have to compute a DMA adder T. And you're starting from uh, the bars, a phys adder T is for the bar, essentially, which is a CPU view of the way the bar has been realized into the CPU's memory map. And the PCI layer supports a lot of translation here. So you're, the, the physical address, even when you're not using IMMUs, even when you're going through the, uh, a bridge, the, the DMA address and the physical address are not necessarily the same. So you do actually need to know your, the two struct devices that are interworking here so that you can calculate all these adjustments even when you're not using IMMUs. And when you are using IMMUs, I assume the IMMU has to know it as well to make an adjustments somehow, or maybe it can, maybe it's wired so it can work with the phys adder T. It's, I think that's the case today is all the IOMU systems can work with the phys adder T and the phys adder T is sort of one to one with the DMA adder T for bars at least. And so that's like, there's ARM systems where that's not true, especially embedded systems with crazy and broken PCI. Uh, all right, clears mud? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next little couple of, the, yeah, the details are endless here. Uh, so the next couple of slides are about HMA range fault, and this is just to kind of talk about, for the RDMA perspective, what we're doing. So we're, we're continuing on Jerome's work to get RDMA ODP and HMM integrated so that RDMA ODP is a lot more like, say, the Nouveau driver in the way it operates the MM. So this gives us all this common code in the MM that's, that's handling this particular use case. And if you, anyone saw my talk on Monday about the challenges we have in RDMA and, and other subsystems like GPU is that the get user pages is really not adequate and we need some more different APIs. So this is kind of the first walking steps of giving us these common APIs so that they can, can move ahead. So, so everybody's kind of aware of, of how this works. Um, the main differences between the two APIs, and they have a very similar purpose, uh, is that the HMM flavor is working with phys adder T's instead of struct pages. So this is like this micro step to getting rid of struct pages is the new APIs are trying to avoid having struct pages. Now, that said, most of the people who are using the HMM range fault today just turn around and get the struct pages anyway because they need them for zone device stuff, uh, particularly device private for the GPU drivers. And then when we're talking about P2P, we'll need to go to get the P2P information, but perhaps there's alternatives there down the road, I, I, I can't really say. And you know, it's, got a, it's got a whole bunch of special properties. I hope, I hope we're getting maybe, maybe a couple months away to actually having this all finished and merged. It's all, it turns out to be a lot of patches and ODP is really, really broken. So it had to get fixed first, which I think I'm almost done on. But this has been a big, big, big powwow from a lot of people contributing, and uh, uh, Christoph Helwig's name is there too. He's been a big help, I think. Uh, he also isn't here, unfortunately. But <coughs> so this is, what I think, where we wanted to get to for the GPU side. And this is Jerome's concept of when somebody wants to do DMA to a page, we can treat it differently than just wanting to CPU access to the page. And, can have this idea that we can then take a DMA fault in, in kind of the MM area. And I, I think we even have a, a callback for this already in the, the device private stuff. And the concept of a DMA fault is that it may not make the page accessible to the CPU, but it does make it accessible for DMA. And, and the key cons sort of the key distinction there is what Jerome was talking about before about atomics. So a, a, a page that's accessible for DMA is obviously accessible to the CPU. That's sort of obvious, I think but it may be a bar page and it may not support atomics, it may not be cache coherent, and it may not 
actually be something you want the CPU to touch in user space because it breaks the programming model. So this sort of in-between state where a page is still inaccessible in the CPU page tables but is DMAable is a new concept, I think, in the kernel. And to, so this is tied into the P2P DMA stuff because essentially it has pages that are always going to return themselves when they DMA fault, essentially, is, is a way to think about it, at least conceptually for how this kind of fits into the MM. Um, and I think the uh, people keep telling me, I don't know anything about GPUs, but people keep telling me that the GPUs have dynamic bars and they need to do all kinds of work when they, when they do their, their faults. But, but would, would you actually make, make it inaccessible? I mean, I thought the, the, the bar could still be mapped on cacheable CPU, could do slow stuff to it, but you'd actually fault it or SIG bust the application <laughs> if it tried to You'd, you'd have to fault it back. For the GPU case, you'd have to fault it back to the CPU. No, but I'm saying, like, in, in, in the general case of, like, uh, like the NVMe, the NVMe yeah. bar target. Okay, so in the general case, we can map a, a bar on a device in kind of two ways. We can map it as you did an MMAP on a device file, like Jerome was talking about. In this case, you get uncached bar memory or maybe write combining bar memory, and you, the application, understand that it's uncached write combining bar memory, and you're not going to put locks in it, you're not going to use atomics on it, because that doesn't work. That's, that's the easy, easy case. The more complicated case is the GPU case, where memory is moving between GPUs inside and, and bar mapped and, and all over the system. In this case, the application doesn't know that it's bar mapped and it has its assumption that it's CPU memory with cacheability that can have that can have spin locks and everything. So you need to keep that illusion up even though it might be bar mapped at, at a certain moment. And John yeah, John I, should talk about this, not me. On the, we we have a programming model um, that's how to say this. Generally we, we, we said okay if um, we just migrate memory back and forth, right? So it's either accessible on the GPU, uh, in which case it's marked um, device private, and that means unmapped on the CPU side, you know, one, one or the other, right? Or if you can't migrate to the GPU, you just leave it on the CPU and have the GPU's page tables point to SysMem, and okay, fine. But um, what you don't do is you don't say, okay, I'm not gonna do that, I'll just, uh, I'll go through the bar mappings, because those, those are not coherent with the um, programming, that the, the little program that you wrote to run on your GPU is not coherent with the accesses through the bar. And so that whole programming model doesn't work, so we just said no. That, you know, so if you, the, the goal here is to have a programming model where you use the same virtual address to refer to the same memory everywhere. And so that's, that's why we lock that out. Does that make sense? All right, John, I think it's your turn. Ah. <laughs> We're running a little little long here, so John's, we're gonna skip a few slides. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I was, uh, uh, was kind of tossed into this just to give you some, uh, another facet of this, uh, which is the get user pages part. And, and the, the, the thing here is that we're, <laughs> we're proposing all this new behavior for these, mainly for get user pages, and we're stacking on top of uh, a, a, a very large, complex system. So we, we find that we can't just um, pop up and say, okay, we've got all this new peer-to-peer -peer stuff. We, we want to have uh, you know, all these things that Jason has been talking about, all this new behavior. But we're sitting on top of this, um, I'm, I'm abbreviating uh, get user pages as, as GUP. Uh, we've got maybe a, a 100 call sites, depending on how you count it. Um, where, where people are calling get user pages. We've got uh, 17 plus, the, the plus means that I've submitted a patch to <laughs> add more flags. <laughs> uh, uh, flags, uh, th these, uh, you'll see them in the next slides. So there's an awful lot of stuff there. And then we've got 10 or 15 API calls. I've got a nice little slide coming up where um, I show how it kind of multiplies out. Um, and so you know, this is a complicated thing. Um, and then worse, it was uh, get user pages was was originally, um, and you can correct me if I, I I don't know the history all that well, but it seems to me that it was originally an MM idea. Um, certainly, when I talked to file systems guys, that it feels that way, <laughs> and, and it's unaware of uh, file systems, device pages, certainly peer to peer, um, and in fact, we had a fun conversation last night where where we were saying, you know. 
nobody understands what get user pages really promises. It's really a weak promise. Well, another way of saying that is it makes a promise that is so ridiculously weak that no reasonable human that looked at it would believe the promise. They would say, well, that, that's so stupid, it's useless. Nobody would, nobody would build that. Obviously, they must mean more, and so I will stack my house of cards here. <laughs> and, and, and that's what happened throughout. Uh, it makes a, will, a, a really weak promise, uh, and people needed more, and so they built stuff on top of it. And 10 years later, people looked around and said, um, uh, you know, all these interactions between you using get user pages to pin memory and things called file systems are broken. You know, and, and that's um, somebody, when I was at LSFMM a year or two ago, <laughs> while I was at the conference, somebody filed a bug at NVIDIA that said, hey, you know, we've got this funny thing um, that, uh, that it just, you know, it, it just breaks, and it was this problem, and so here I am. <laughs> so let me get another slide, because, right. Um, so this, this helps me a little bit. All of these are, um, if you capitalize and put the words F-O-L-L underscore in front, so like follow split, follow populate, those are all get user pages flags. So at your call sites, you can, uh, you can set these flags. You can set as many as you want, you know? <laughs> and then, <laughs> really, 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 you know, there's not a lot of rules out there. And, and, then, and then you can call all these different APIs. And so if you multiply them all together, it's, it's a really large number. And, the part that I really enjoy is that, so you could say, okay, you know, follow split and follow mlock and touch and maybe populate and, uh, you know, I'd like a little follow long term with that. And I'm going to call, uh, yeah, I'll call uh, get user pages, which in turn calls another one that's exposed. You, you know, follow page can be called separately, but it's also called by get user pages itself, right? So it's really out of hand. And then if I say, okay, quick, tell me, are these pages pinned? Uh, you know, quick answer. You know, well, okay. Um, let me check. Does follow split pin page? No, it doesn't. Um, how about if I if I say populate? Okay, well that sets follow get, which usually means that it's going to work its way down to here and pin the page. Okay, great so far. You know, so it's really hard. And if you change it or use it or um, in new ways like you know peer to peer and all this other stuff, you're going to find that it becomes almost impossible to to get it right. So. <laughs> Um, we also, we, of course, we want to add new things here, you know, like get user B back. So instead of passing in, uh, instead of dealing with struct pages, it'd be nice to deal with bio, bio vex, right? That'd be nice. So crit, uh, Christ, Christopher, Christoph, 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 Christoph Helwig, uh, asked to, to do that. So I'm kind of looking at that. Um, other people have said, well, it should, it should work with a scatter gather list, um, and then, because that's how most of the block stuff deals, so we should be able to do that instead of struct pages. And then uh, Ira uh, <laughs> jumped in and, and uh, is proposing v or pin pages as a way to, to deal with DAX. And then, of course, range fault is not get user pages at all. It just kind of um, does some of the, it does things that are similar um, by not pinning pages. <laughs> Let's see. Not too far? Sorry. Oh, I see. Just hit run again. Hey, yeah, I missed. That's pretty good. Oh, I see. I'm not supposed to push that button. Sorry. Right. Okay. So um, this is kind of the same thing. So um, file system awareness. In other words, if you call get user pages, um, and then the file system is also operating on that. It's, it's, it's all broken. Um, <laughs> so and, and the peer mappings, were, yeah, were one, of, one of the ideas that we want to stack on top here is we want to say, well, I think we want to say, OK, you've got these zone device pages. What happens if you call get user pages on those? Well, it seems like a cool idea if you set up bar mappings at that point. You know, that makes sense uh, in, in some cases. Um, we want to define the interaction with HMM, with the HMM range fault. Uh, and then, uh, again, you know, should we have these different APIs? And, and one of the things I want to bring up here, and let's see how we're doing, um, is kind of a small point. But if you, if you go back, um, you look at this, yeah. 
there's, there's this constant, if you try to get this stuff reviewed, you're gonna find that you're gonna go back and forth a little bit. So someone will say, well, okay, you know, um, I get this new API uh, and I've got all these flags, so I don't really wanna have a wild west of people setting all these flags out there at the call sites. So I want wrapper functions. So the wrapper functions should, should set the flags. So if you call this new function that I, Ira's gonna talk a lot more about, um, it should set follow pin, which is a new flag. And it should set maybe follow long term. Uh, okay, great, except that some of the call sites only want one of those flags. Um, okay, well, let's have more wrappers then, right? So, so it's a, there's a balance, right? And so I'm kind of curious you know, where people see the balance if they've looked at any of this. Uh, you know, how many wrappers are you going to tolerate? Do you want a wrapper for, for every specific thing, or do you want to just do that with flags? At some point, we've got to come up with, you know, not so many unconstrained flags. So I'm leaning toward really wrappers across the board. Uh, that would be my first, that's, that's where I would reach. But then again, somebody, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I think wrappers are okay, but the, but, but, that explodes the API. I would rather maybe see some warn-ons or something that basically, and some documentate kernel docs that say, this function takes these flags and only these flags. So, so some, something the same, because like when I first started looking at this stuff, I, there was get user pages remote, and all it did was call get user pages with the follow remote flag. And I, I asked Dave Hansen, who's in my group, because I saw he wrote it, and I'm like, why'd you do this? He goes, Oh, I don't know. It just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And so, I mean, that's kind of what's happened is sometimes we think a wrapper's right and sometimes we think a flag's right and nobody's wrong. It's just like that's how it's kind of grown organically, like you said last night, into this mess. So I think we need to, we do need to kind of make a decision, like how do we want this? But um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and the unconstrained flag passing, there are, you can pass flags that basically conflict with each other, and there's no checks currently. Nobody does that, so nothing's broken, you know, in well, some... Yeah, that's, the wrapper function can kind of help you check in that case. If you, if you had a wrapper function, then it says, I know you're trying to do, you're trying to do, you're trying to pin these pages so that um, some, you know, direct I.O. driver can use them, or, right. you know, so here's your case. Uh, so I know you need these flags. So, so generally, I guess the idea is that if you have like plenty of users that like need the same same set of flags, then then wrapper is a good thing, yeah, because it's just easier to find and you know reason about and so on. You don't have to check, you know, is this the normal user or is this is this setting some unusual set of flags? Yeah. But then of course you are going to have some users that always want something special, especially with get user pages. So, so then probably for those, they will just have to use flags. Right. Yeah? So, for, so the, the cases that are not really that common, you have like two, three users in the whole kernel, then... then okay, so we'll just do it by the numbers. We'll, it will well, yeah, I would just, like common for the things. common cases, I would do it, I would create a wrapper, and then, then those that do not fall into the, any of the common cases, then because, for example, I would ex expect device drivers to all do more or less the same thing. Yeah. Right. I think it's, I mean, there's a lot of flags that are just for the MMs internal use. That's the, yeah. the one Ira mentioned. So those, right. those need to be kept away from the device driver, and the device driver should never, ever, ever be allowed to use those. Yeah, right? exactly. That'll make our life a lot so, simpler. And so, and so that's where I'm saying that the, the gut calls should enforce and say, if you're a device driver and you're using these flags, uh-uh, you know, no. Like, you know... Well, I think and one of the, the way at the call know, side, can't is, do that. the call side is where you know where, where the flags are right. Right, internal to the call, the the call actually does some checks and says these are internal flags. If if some driver is passing these in, you know, and and the internal MM calls call something else that's an internal call that allows those flags. Yeah, we, we might even, might even as you're talking, we might even consider just not even exporting the exporting just to modules the one that can take flags only. Right. Yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of flags that are okay. Like, the, the flags that are composable and don't conflict with each other, those are fine. Like, read, write, long term, those are all reasonable things to use for flags. It's when they interact with, oh, I needed a special flag to trigger this small behavior deep, deep down in the stack. Those are, those are internal flags. Yeah. Like K-dubs. Yeah, for, yeah. Well, and, and I know um, <laughs> when, it, when we were talking about follow pin, um, Michael Hako was, basically saying, okay, just, just hide that. I don't want to even see that flag at the call sites. 
So. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I agree because what I was saying is that actually like device driver writers are about the most coolest users of get user pages yeah? because like when some chem core MM stuff uses get user pages then hopefully they know what they are doing. But then, then if you want to use get user pages in your device driver to just somehow get your user buffer then probably you should just have a simple helper and you don't have to care about all those pages. Basically read or write is the only thing you care about. And maybe long term, kind of, yeah. But that are basically only two things you care about and you shouldn't be bothered by having to go through another 14 follow get user pages flex and think which one's unique. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, I got a couple minutes. I wanted to make sure I um, talked a little bit about, okay. Um, did I cover the Yeah, uh, yeah, I want to cover Iris thing a little bit. Okay, um, just to kind of give a lead in, so uh, uh, to connect this with what Ira's gonna talk about next, one of those things we listed was um, was called VAD or pin pages. Uh, of course, I'm encouraging uh, the name to be slightly changed, but <laughs> never mind. <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is a very interesting thing going on where we're saying, okay, you know, as we go through this constellation of API calls that are related, that are basically GUP, um, we're, we're gonna find ourselves splitting them into different names, right, probably. I mean, instead of just having get user pages, there's probably gonna be new stuff like, we'll, we'll pick a new name for something so that we can keep all this stuff straight. And uh, these are, I guess you could call them wrapper functions, perhaps, yeah. but this one is a little bit more than that because this one has a different API. This one. Uh, in addition to all the other goodies you have to pass up, um, this one is gonna take uh, a context that the call site says, okay, I, I know my MM and my open file descriptor, um, and the file descriptor has a lease attached to it, a file lease, um, and so everything's connected all up, you'll hear more about it, and now it's okay to actually pin this page, and uh, it's a separate ref count in addition to the page ref count, it's kind of overloaded, but conceptually it's separate the, the page is now pinned with a different counter, uh, and the rest of the MM and file system uh, functions such as try to unmap, page make clean, um, these things can say, oh, I recognize that you're specially pinned, and I, I will, you know, when you come in, sure, you're firing a MMU notifier, you know, that's all very nice, but if, if things aren't, you know, if it's, if it's a device or something that is unaware of those kind of things, uh, we have a file lease that explains how this is going to work. And so um, I think this, the reason I'm interested in this is that this breaks the log jam. This is the, you know, this is the way forward uh, from the, the, dead, the, the, the deadlock that we've had. So w would anybody like to bike shed the name while we're here and get it out of your system? Well, no, it, it's actually, this is what it needs to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've already changed this. Oh, what's the new name? To what? You add or pin pages. Oh no, that was the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, we, we can't do that. You have to start. I don't like typing. We just have enough. You know, better here than in the name. Oh, and um, yeah, the put user page. You may have seen that go by. That's um, we used to just say get user pages and then put page. Um, I've added in put user page as the complement to get user pages because, in some cases, you know, not all the not all the cases for the gut flags, but in some cases we're gonna have this new uh, count that says it's pinned um, by get user pages as opposed to some other way of elevating the page ref count. And, and so you need a corresponding call to unpin it and that's what put user page is gonna do or does. But um, then there was a discussion and I agree with Michal that it would be good to, to actually also the pinning part, like whenever you say full pin then actually you wouldn't be allowed to just put it but you would have wrapper function basically to use the pin semantics, yeah, basically set the full pin. Right, and this is that. that, this is, uh, in fact, this is the, the set of wrapper functions you're seeing here. Yeah, but, 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 so as far as I understand what IRA is working on will also set for long term, but you don't want to, you don't want long term for all the no. users that pin. No? no? No, you want set long term. No, we, we had this discussion on the last. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, the follow long term is kind of independent from the follow pin. Okay. Uh, th th this, these are, this is, should only happen for follow pin. Right, yeah. 
that's that's where he was saying where some some of these should um, uh, some of these should be flags exported and some shouldn't. And I think the long term should be exported because some people may want to pin, yeah. but they know it's going to be a relatively short term pin. Others like RDMA are going to want to pin long term and they specify the long term flag. So yeah, I I agree with you, Jan. And yeah. that's the way it's coded. Right. I mean, those are very Currently. nice and composable and flags. Like long term yeah. does not affect the behavior of any of the other flags. Like when you start having them interact as a bad set of flags. So, so hold that thought because we just hit right. the end of the t of session, and that is we're going to go into it uh, okay. more with Ira in the next right. one. Do I need my laptop or the slides on? Uh, I don't have your slides. Okay, I'll get it. So is there any other discussion? Jerome's got some. Yeah, yeah, just I wanted to point out, you don't want to allow gate user page on the device if it's a malloc or a map of a regular file. Otherwise, you have to seek bus if there's a CPU access, or seek bus or seek seg fault. So you do not want to allow gate user page to work on the device pages that are actually well, inside. No, you you uh, mean device private pages? Like this device had, private pages, yeah, yes. But sort of you, you cannot get any, any other kind of zone device pages inside a regular MMM. A VMA. So for me, regular VMA is a VMA that is coming from MMAP, a uh, private anonymous VMA, or uh, an MMAP of a regular file, so it's MMAP of not a device file. All right. Um, yeah, I'm okay. I just got to find my slides now. Didn't know if they would be. All right, well, while I was checking out his slides, does anybody have any questions for John or Jerome or Dan or Jan on our pages problems, problems with pages? Oh, there's all kinds of problems with pages. Okay, so um, I'm going to go quickly through the first few slides I, because I drew, I drew pictures. And for people who are here uh, a little over a year ago, um, or at LSF, this problem's kind of been going on for a long time. So, so uh, a bug occurred with file system DAX where RDMA pages would corrupt the file system um, and there was some issues. So Dan just threw in a, a long-term, a another GUP user um, uh, call site called get user pages long-term and that would prevent any file system DAX pages from being pinned. So my job, since I joined Dan's group, has been to solve this problem because I come from an RDMA background. And after much discussion and, and a very heated discussion at, at LSFMM, um, we kind of decided that you know failing truncate was okay with some caveats. Um, those caveats were that admins needed to understand why their truncate was failing on the file system so that they could override um, any uh, application that was holding these pins um, by killing them or telling the user, hey, you need to quit your job or, or something to that ex extent. <laughs> so since LSF, um, so oh, since wow. LSF, um, I basically come up with a fail truncate patch set. And I submitted that patch set a couple weeks ago um, and there was some feedback on it. So I want to quickly go over what that patch set did because I drew pictures because on the mailing list, there's a lot of confusion, even amongst people that are really familiar with this problem, as to what um, as to what's being going on. And so the the problem really is that you have a process, and in its file descriptor table, you have a data file mapped um, to um, to like a DAX file system. So I open a file on a file system like foo, and then I M map it, and now I've got that memory, and then I go ahead and register it with my RDMA device, which also has a file descriptor. So that's coming into these RDMA file objects. So this is like a struct file. There's an RDMA uverbs thing. And under that, it has a memory region. And then when I call register, basically I'm registering these pages that's connected to this memory region, but those pages are actually mapped through the address space and the inode to this data file. And of course, I have a VMA because I am mapped that thing. Okay, so I have like, like there's all these different file descriptors, different file objects that refer to different files. And the key is that in order to keep track of which files are pinned by this other subsystem, I've come up with like a new GUP thing, which is the V adder uh, pin pages, U adder, get user pages, V adder pin pages, <laughs> so whatever new call we call it and how long I have to type. <laughs> to link these two together via a file pin object. And so what, what we came up with is um, through some discussions and Jan uh, very helpfully said, you know, 
let's just figure out like how to know whether the, the admin, what process they need to kill. So this file pin, and, and this kind of goes on because part of the problem is what happens when um, you may unmap this memory, you may close this data file, but these, these pins still exist in your RDMA subsystem and you can still use them. Okay, so at this point, if you look in procfs, this file, this, this process currently with the upstream kernel has um, no linkage to this pin file. And so there's no way to tell that RDMA went off and pinned these pages and this file is, is locked in memory and the, and the, and the trunk case is going to fail. So that's where these file pin objects come in. And, and it kind of gets worse because with a fork, we now have all these file descriptors forked. We have all these same file descriptors pointing to the same struct files, including the RDMA struct file, which also has these pins. And even though you can't use the memory region because of RDMA, and, and you can sort of, but you may not be able to, the pin still exists, which means it'll still fail the truncate, okay? So, so then it's it even worse because now somebody can come along with STM writes and basically send this file descriptor, tri, uh, descriptor to any random other process which has no concept of any memory maps, no concept of any open files, you know. So this is where the patch set stands right now is the key is the file pinning here ties any subsystem that does any long-term pin to the file that got pinned. Now when you call the gut call, you and this is where this additional context information that, that John mentioned, this context information comes in and allows the GUP subsystem to set up this, this linkage. Um, we could add other things to that context depending on what we need, but right now that's the main purpose. And then this subsystem, when it unpins, specifies the same information so the GUP can tear it down. And so what this allows is um, for RDMA, for uh, XDP that has sockets, which also has a struct file somewhere up the stack. It's, it's not plumbed in yet, but conceptually, anything that has a file descriptor to a subsystem that's going to do a long-term pin, that, that file descriptor is going to be um, um, shown in PROC FS as having this file pin and basically locking this file from trunking. Okay, so, simple. Any, a question? Oh. Yeah. So, so, so I, I had a question that was interesting. So, when you have this one proce process A, yeah, and now you fork to process B. So, so process B cannot use the RDMA context to do stuff. How, how does it work? It, I, I no, it certainly can, right? So, yeah. Yeah. All, all of the processes can use all the things, and it, it's it's ridiculous. It's like normal file descriptors. If you have the RDMA yeah. file descriptor, you can use the RDMA things in that file descriptor. Oh, okay. And I mean, this isn't an, this. I was shown it with RDMA, but you can make the same diagram with VFIO. You can make the same diagram with Okay, yeah, GPUs I want to understand. And, yeah, like any chart device, right? Yeah. Some device drivers set a flag on the on the device file when you open them, so they force a flag where you can have crow exec or you can yeah. have also a wipe on fork. Yeah. Um, and uh, so some device driver will actually not allow you to use the device after you fork. So it, but, that, but but not but, all, but yeah. The, but the advisory, right? That's right. not, there's nothing that prevents, there's no way that the kernel prevents you from passing file descriptors around. That's right. like fundamental Unix. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the key because even if the file descriptor gets passed and even if you can't use it here, if this process goes away and now I try, an admin tries to truncate this file here, I can't. And I don't know, I need to know that it's these processes that are holding the pin, not the original process. So that's, that's the other key is even if the file descriptor gets passed, as long as it's still open, whether it's useful or not is irrelevant. It's still that that ownership has been passed to some other process and we need to track that ownership. So I saw a really, really, really big mailing list read about this topic and yeah. maybe it's a good point to pause and say, you know, does, does anybody want to debate IRA on this design or say they don't like it or anything? Yeah, I, Okay, Dan loves it. <laughs> okay, well, let me, um, and, and so, just a quick slide on some of the other um, subsystems. But like, I, I do want to mention, uh, on the previous slide, though, um, right, so 
where the thread left off, the email thread, um, we had it at one process, because um, this is what Dave Chinner's thing was, was that one, one process can own the lease, only, only one. Yeah. And, but that's today's world. And I think where we want to go is, in tomorrow's world, you want to have a set of lease rules that allow more than one process to claim a lease. I, I have more slides. Good. <laughs> yeah. Good straight. Yeah, great, great, yeah, <laughs> perfect. So real quick though, um, there are some other subsystems that actually pin memory you know, through syscalls and other things. So I also kind of threw in an MM struct ability to kind of track the file pins. But I'm, I'm gonna kind of gloss over that right now because let's get into the objections because um, yes, there was a large thread on the mailing list concerning this. So um, number one, Jason did point out that my um, interpretation of the lifetime of the uverbs file object was incorrect. And so I had a, a bug um, that I've actually fixed in continuous wor in, in, in work since uh, the patch set was uh, submitted. And so I've, I've fixed that bug. So there was an issue, got it fixed. But the biggest issue, and I think this is the biggest contention, yeah. is the semantics on the lease. So I kind of gloss over the fact that in order to actually uh, do this pin, when the gut code is actually walking the pages and it file, uh, finds the data file um, pages, it then says, oh wait, I can't take this pin without a lease. And so that was also part of what came out of LSF is that in order to be able to pin pages with a file, we needed this le lease mechanism such that basically the file system was being told, um, we, you, you can't, the, the layout of this file is pinned, the layout can't change, and I can't do anything with it as long as this, this lease or this pin exists. Sorry, I just, so John is busy adding a pin that tells the file system that the pages are, can't be messed with and can't, so you're adding yet another pin. No. That the pages can't yeah. be messed so, with. So, so there, there are two things, yeah. So there, one is a pin which is going to be like pin counter that is in the struct page. And that's ultimately what says to the file system, you know, you cannot do write back on this because someone is, for example, DMAing just to the page. Yeah? So, so that's one thing. Uh, and that's going to be used by direct IO, by all the short term, long term, all the users. But then there is the second thing that for, for the long term users, you have other set of problems. Okay. Like you have to fail truncate or do some other stuff. Okay. So the long term users will have to have a lease so that you can fail truncate, or basically, you know, the file system knows that this is not just a wait for a yeah. bit and it will get better, yeah? Yeah, I misspoke. Long-term pins will require the lease. That, that, that's a more correct statement. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's actually coming together pretty nicely. So what, you've got basically two flags to talk about, follow long-term and follow, follow pinned. And so, in, in all of these cases, you're gonna need to set follow pinned, and in some of these cases, you'll need to set follow long-term. Right. And long-term is associated with the leases, and pin is associated with that special ref count and put user page. Oh, I really don't like that name, pin. Can we, can we name uh, that something better? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> okay. I, I don't really care, you know, if you have better name. <laughs> I, it just seems to me that that one is all about m allowing the pages to be written to, like ma allowing dirty to be called, and maybe that you mean pin or no, mean no, the, 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 the meaning the, of that flag? The follow pin flag means that uh, the page has to be released with put user page and, it re and it's a direct tie to the new pin count. Right, but the new pin count is only about that page dirty, right? Uh, no, the, the, no. Uh, the it's question It's really about telling, some, uh, telling file systems and also MM that there is someone who is physically accessing the page and you, don't know, you know nothing about it. So and you have to count how many of those there So are. basically you cannot, it's really, like if you have page reference, we still do all sorts of stuff with the page when the page reference count is elevated, but with pin we have to be really much more careful because someone is operating on the page data. Right, okay. Pin one. Yeah, I might think about that a little bit more. Anyway, so um, yeah, I kind of glossed over that, that they, we need these leases. So a lot of the debate on the mailing list was who owns the lease, who can remove the lease, and when can it be removed, okay? Finally, there's this concept, and, and I think if you go back to the picture I had, um, there's this concept of, of when you kind of lose all of these um, connections to this data file, 
Um, effectively, this lease object, this is kind of what we're referring to as, as the, it, it's not really, there's, a, there's this lease thing that was called that's, that's hanging off of the data file. That, that object still exists in the kernel, but from a user space perspective, nobody really has the lease because you can't call and actually release that lease anymore if you've closed these file descriptors. So there was a lot of debate on when can you close a file descriptor, could we hang the file descriptor, could we not hang the file descriptor, you know, what happens. Um, I, I was kind of looking at it, well, you know, maybe we just don't let this happen, um, you know, we just, you know, but there are some RDMA use cases that are coming down the pipe, there's a, there's a presentation in a, in a couple sections here um, who, who uh, people are wanting to actually take these file descriptors and, and send them to other uh, processes. So I really believe that, mm -hmm. that having these zombie leases is okay. Um, so I said that I actually fixed the struct file. Um, there's a circular reference in the struct file. And so this is a picture of kind of the current state of my patches. Um, and they haven't been released yet, but I just wanted to, because pictures are cool, and at least for me, because I'm a Mac guy. Uh, <laughs> so. Should I say that at a Linux? No, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> and you also don't work on RDMA. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, hey. I don't work on RDMA. Because you work for Intel. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> I would call those anyway. leases defunct. Is, is, is that, that matches more around? Defunct could be, yeah. I. Yeah, well, they're they're not defunct and they're not yeah. zombies. They're yeah. held by an they're object held. that's internal to the kernel, right? Yeah. Or not even internal. They're held by an MR object, which is actually exposed to user space. I, from what I can gather, all of this is about debugging for the admin to be able to see the lease object, right, under the thing that's holding it. And the thing that's holding it, in at least RDMA's case, is the MR. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree. But the thing is that, like the lease, which is the yeah, well, like the thing, thing here. So, so it has a notion of owner, and the owner is going to be this guy, but and actually this file descriptor, like this, this arrow is actually a file descriptor. Yeah? So, so the owner will be going to be this arrow, and when this arrow goes away, the lease is in kind of a strange state where. So why why does the lease have an owner? Is because. So there are two purposes. One is that when, when something happens with the lease, you are supposed to send a signal. So you have to know, and the signal has to have, have the file descriptor in its whatever. No, that, that makes yeah, sense. Uh, so, so basically the lease has to know who to signal and what file descriptor right. is, but is it. So, so but I, we, that we talked about this too. And that that gets to the next point of so this exclusive lease or unbreakable lease, which I actually do like John's name of unbreakable lease because yeah. if it's an unbreakable lease, there is no SIG IO sent. So that becomes I a agree that point, this is I believe this is more like uh, like aesthetic kind of problem because we don't expect signals to be needed for this, but still it's like the lease is in kind of non started state, let's say. And the second thing is and I, I didn't manage to check the code in detail, but the lease has the semantics that it's not a lock, really. Yeah? So, so, so the the owner of uh, so if you get like an exclusive lease, which means that nobody is supposed to change the layout of the file, then the owner of the lease is still supposed to be able to do anything with the file. So you can change the file under your hands, basically. Yeah, Dave mentioned that. that that's, that's that's a big problem. For that's this, the supposed semantics. This picture. But well, any other process which doesn't own the lease is not supposed to be able to do it. And I he's supposed to block, basically. And I he's going to block because when the file layout, change, file layout changes, we will call break lease, and the owner just passes fine, and the non-owner will, will get blocked on the lease. So, I mean, that does but speak to the concept that there is no, these leases do not have owners. No, they do. They well, do. I mean, but they don't they because there's no one who's allowed to change the layout once these things are created. That's the semantic we need. Right, so that, that's where I differ with what you said is, yeah. is what I actually implemented is um, um, uh, e-deadlock. So if, yeah. if the owner tries to break this lease through some other call, like another thread or something, okay. then he's gonna get a deadlock because he's now done something where he said, I don't want this lease broken, but now I tried to break it. So, yeah, okay, so, so, so you are now changing the lease, so, so leases are not right. invented for, for this kind of thing. Leases already exist for PNFS, is probably the most prominent users, but there are others, but PNF is probably the easiest <laughs> to understand. So, so, so 
like PNFS user will basically take this lease to pin the file layout. So basically a client looks which physical blocks are used, basically you modifies these blocks, changes allocation of the file. He just doesn't want other clients to do the same thing with the file, to, to not change the mapping. Yeah. So that's why the le current lease semantics is that the owner of the lease can do anything because he has it cached locally and knows what he's doing and know every everybody else blocks. That's why the semantics is currently defined. And if you want to define something else, sure you can, but it has to be clearly explained what the semantics is and define it so that there is no confusion. I, I, I agree with that. So I'm, I'm working on nailing down <laughs> what those semantics exactly are because the other thing that the current patch set has is, is a concept of a layout like flag that is a layout lease. And, and I don't think that's fully needed. I think mm -hmm. all we really need is an unbreakable flag. Yeah. And to extend the semantics of what a read lease means and see, this is kind of part of the problem is, and this is why I added the layout flag, is by, by saying we wanted an unbreakable layout lease, it was kind of a, it, was, it meant that we were, well, we're actually taking a read lease, but we're taking a read lease on the layout, okay? So we're not modifying the layout, we're only, we, we only want to be able to read it, but the data is right. So the semantics of the lease are somewhat confusing because we're not taking a right lease, even though we're writing to the data and we have these yeah. pins and we have RDMA going to it, but it's a read lease for the layout, which is unbreakable, which means a write lease will try to break it, but can't, and it will get either e deadlock if it's the same process or basically just <coughs> okay. uh, an e-text busy, and then, um, uh, and then the system in can take... Okay. It, does that sound reasonable? Yes, it will be also... Another note, it would be good to like explain the RDMA requirements because you say you have problem with the process itself changing and not other process being able to change the layout. Yeah, or well, I mean, that's, that's what we're after here. We, we, the kernel is going to set up DMA to these pages. Yeah. And once that DMA is established, the, the file system cannot change those pages. Well, and I don't care if it's this process or another process. The file system cannot be yeah, okay, to change so, those pages. So the, that the would be solved by the static. The layout is, is also pinned through the lease. The, the data can be written to, and and we don't want the file system to try to write that data back. It's, it's yeah okay. So but then then that really matches the kind of read layout lease. Yeah. So so basically you don't want the layout to change, but even yourself are not allowed to change it. Yes, absolutely. Because if the same process tried to change it, they would break their own DMA that they just set up. Yeah. Unwillingly. Right. But I mean, so from we can't a, allow it's that. not just. It's not just like, it's from a correctness perspective. Once we're doing DMA, the DMA is, cannot be controlled and stopped. We can't allow the pages to become somehow incoherent with that DMA. That's, yeah, yeah. that's like the whole DAX problem in a nutshell. Yeah, so, so what do you expect then to happen when you will try to pin page that doesn't have underlying storage like this? So you can take a lease, the file doesn't have to be allocated. Yeah? It can be just empty file without yeah, any Yeah, but then, then we'll get user pages of pages and... and get to, but uh, get user pages will give you back page cache pages. So, you know, it's perfectly happy to do it. But there is no underlying storage. It, it, but, well, you don't care really. It, I, DMA doesn't care, right? Yeah. As long as It'll when we're DMA done, the DMA, it all goes puts back. Yeah, b and for, yeah, okay. But so I yeah, but but if and if you do it in case of DAX, so if if you do it in case of DAX, then basically there would be block allocation happening inside get user pages, yeah, basically. Yes. And that but starts to sound a little dead. And so that is allowed to happen or not? No, because with DAX, the pages are the, the pages back. are the physical storage. But yeah. I'm saying you want a workflow. Where you say layout lease and then call get user pages, and then get user pages may cause allocations, and but it can't because you have a layout lease. That doesn't sound right to me. Yeah. So, so 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 what do you do? Yeah. So so, like we could just bail. So we could just so the pinning could just bail out with an error if it finds that actually it would have to cause block allocation. It would basically get e deadlock or whatever. Yeah. Or would block indefinitely. But you have to somehow deal with it so that you don't deadlock against yourself. If you, yeah. if you call it. Yeah. Yeah. And you so, have to. So, but that puts yeah. another user requirement on the user to like touch the pages first or something. But I think it's okay. I mean, these these are these are fancy apps. So you could you could you could require f allocate prior to prior to taking that pin. 
And if you yeah. did, if, if you didn't allocate ahead of time, then then that, yeah, that's, you your own, that's your own problem. So, so my my initial idea would be that you would just kind of make sure that you bail out with with at all if the underlying storage isn't allocated and you need it. Like, like for page cache, we don't care, but for DAX, we would have to allocate underlying storage, which conflicts with the having holding the least. Yeah, that's probably what'll happen right now. And then that, 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 and since the user is the one that calls the F control to set the lease, the user's responsible for allocating and dealing with any races, because it's racy too. I do F allocate, then I get my lease, but am I still allocated or did I get, did something happen in the meantime? It's not, it's not ideal. Like maybe it would be better if you started, you get the lease that makes it exclusive for your process, then you do the F allocate, then you switch that lease to be blocked permanently for y even yourself. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, are we getting this in notes? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty complex discussion, hard to capture in one minute. Yeah, no, that's, that's okay. It's video recorded though. It is. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, go. I'm gonna watch it. You're gonna watch it. <laughs> I, I totally, I'm totally on yesterday. It's video, it's recorded, right? All right, so we're, we're, um, we're getting to the last four minutes here. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I'm not a fox. <laughs> I don't do anything. Um, <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, yeah, all right, but but generally that semantic sounds okay. Yeah, so so, so that's uh, why I wanted like probably let's start with RDMA constraint and like what RDMA would like to see like the semantics, then like define the new type of lease, describe it, and then the like get to the particular linking of file structures and stuff like that. Yeah, like because if we don't get the first two steps, then the people looking at the step three with the st like diagram like this will scratch their head and say, "Oh, why do you do this so complicated? And what's actually the problem? And it's and it's like different than anything else we do. And why?" <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And and I think I think the current lease uh, calls allow for a downgrade upgrade so I mean I think what you're saying you could take a release you could F allocate and then you can um, and that ensures nobody else has access to the file so that your F allocate isn't and racy and then right. and then you allocate it and then you upgrade the release to a unbreakable and then you can pin it that yeah makes I, sense and I don't think that's really that hard to do does that sound reasonable I I, I didn't think about the file system well, it's racy then. It's it's racy because if you don't have a lease, then some other process yeah. could go and change the lease or make the pages cowable or do something. Right. Yeah. So right. so I guess so by taking the read lease to begin with, nobody else can have the file descriptor open in any other process. So that basically guarantees nobody else is f allocating, you know, half your yeah. data or well, or f truncating at the same time you're f allocating. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Right. Which yeah, would be just I, great. Yeah. I. I Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess what Jason said, like first take it exclusively so that you can modify the file and no one else can set up the file as you need it. And then if you want the self protection, then downgrade to Right. I think it yeah. makes the flag that I was trying to define <laughs> really clear what it is. It's what you said, self protection. It's yeah. I'm it, it no one is allowed to change this, is what the flag says. And it cannot be broken. Yeah. So there's no SIG IOs. I can't change it my as the owner. There's no such thing as an owner. It's like a yeah. special mode. It, yeah. it might be better to take a write lease than downgrade it to a read unbreakable. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the semantics we want. We want to be able to write. Yeah, that makes change sense. change the yeah. allocation. Change the layout. Allocation, yeah. And then do a read unbreakable, which is fix this. Yeah. Like, like not fix, you know, <laughs> static. Make static. Yeah, make it static. <laughs> make yeah, the, the Dave, actually, in, when we've we, we been going back and forth about this, we, we had, he talked about se calling that ceiling. Seal the file, like allocate it, do everything you do, and yeah. seal it. Yeah, there's there's precedent in the APIs and user space for that idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, that that right, might I'll make it clear to. I'll, I'll other be people. watching this video back, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna uh, write I that up. Captured your final solution. The final Please. solution. Okay. Sounds ominous. I'll, this is it. <laughs> this is it. I'm done. That, that sounds really ominous. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. I guess that's it. I'm All right. And so before we wanna run for the break, does anyone have any other questions, or Anyone comments? for the last hour? Like, please, any comments? 
Okay. Okay. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed our Get User Pages and Zone Device adventure for RDMA. <laughs> it felt like I've been here for a little while. So I think after the break, we're doing um, discussion about IBND. So this is this is our friends from I Ionis and ProfitBricks. And if you're here, great. Okay. So get your laptop set up for after the break. And thank you. Um, hi, um, we are Jack Wang and uh, I am Daniel Kipnis from uh, uh, IONOS uh, Cloud GmbH and we're going to uh, show us a couple of slides uh, about uh, our driver, which is, so um, IBMBD is a block device which just allows to map a remote block device over DMA and um, it uh, consists uh, in total out of four modules. Uh, so it has on the client side uh, um, uh, IBMPT client which presents itself as a local uh, um, block device. It has a server part on the server side which would access uh, the real uh, block device. And it has um, two corresponding transport modules, client and server, which is this IBTRS layer is responsible for establishing RDMA multiple RDMA connections and uh, multipathing and automatic reconnect and so on. I just wanted to briefly go over the main features of, uh, uh, of IBTRS because we, uh, they have been discussed on the mailing list a uh, couple of times, but still. And so main feature of IBTRS as a transport uh, layer is that we pre-reserve memory on server side. So on connection establishment server allocates Q depth of uh, buffers of fixed size, and those buffers are uh, in sole responsibility of the client. Client decides how to use them. Then the uh, client um, does RDMA writes with immediate uh, uh, field for writes and requests reads, um, and then server would reply with RDMA writes. So this allows us for, so we have a trade-off between memory pre-allocation and better performance since we don't have a registration and unregistration on server side in IO path for writes. Also, yeah? Yeah. IPRS, could it stand on its own? Yes, it's just a standalone uh, module. It has an API and you can call, basically the API it provides is to send or request the receive of SG lists, get together list with read write semantics. So it's, it's basically. So, why did you create, uh, two, two so uh, our original idea, what, uh, a plan would be that we would have uh, more users for this IBTRS layer. Um, the, the, the thing is that um, uh, the standard uh, uh, approach where we have initiator and target uh, it, it says that we have a client and then we have a storage device with, which is equipped with NVMe, SSD, SCSI, whatever devices. And the idea behind IBTRS would be that two storages would be able to communicate with each other. For example, in an, in an, um, if uh, we, we plan to uh, implement a distributed rate solution and so, so on, so that independently of what the target device is, I just want to be capable of, if I received on one storage a scatter together list, which I can map to BIO or to whatever I wish, um, I can forward it to, to the next storage or request a read if I'm, for example, reconstructing a failed device locally from another storage. So basically we wanted this IBTRS not to be uh, unidirectional from initiator to target, but would be to just between two any Linux hosts. Where So we have two Linux hosts that are connected over RDMA and for some reason we want to be you want to send or request reads for of SG lists. That was the basic idea of, for, for this architecture. And further on, when we establish, we establish, it's configurable, but we established uh, one RDMA connection per CPU, and this allows us for our particular use case, we have customer VMs pinned to some running on, on some CPUs and they would produce IOs on those CPUs. What we would wanted to achieve in our case is that those I, um, re replies to those re requests would be processed on the same CPU. So if we set accordingly the secure vectors of these connections and then 
distribute the IRQs to, to accordingly then our IOs are kind of pinned to the CPUs where they are produced, the replies. And yeah, this as a system tr transport, I guess it allows some uh, two different multipath policies. <coughs> one is round robin and another one is where we choose the path with the minimum uh, in flight. Um, for, 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 for the next I.O. So I, I don't understand how you avoid unregistration without creating security problems. Um, what, 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 what do you mean well, exactly? You, you have to have unregistration to deny client access to the memory buffers before you do anything with the memory buffers. So We do, we do need to register uh, if, if it, for example, on the right, on, 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 on the right, so we, we get user buffers and we, we want to send it to remote memory of the of the server. So instead, as NVMe over Fabrics, for example, is doing to, uh, to send a command and then the server would do a RDMA read, we just write directly into the memory of, of the server, which is pre-registered. But of course, if we need to do a read, then of course we need to register the user buffers that we need to read. No, so we do need to... I'm not talking about what I'm saying. Once you do that right, and yeah. the server wants to touch that memory because yeah. the client wrote, wrote to it, it yeah. needs to unregister it. You can't touch memory that's got an active R key. Why, 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 why I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so I, I've wrote, I've written stuff into re registered memory and then I pass it down to log device. Oh, or you whatever. definitely can't do that. Because? Because, because at any moment, if the R key is active, <gasps> somebody untrusted could write to that memory at any moment, as long as there's an active R key. I don't think they care. They have to care because you can't touch, you can't pass something to the block layer that's changing. The block layer wants to deal with things that's stable, otherwise you can cause corruption at the block layer level. But, yeah, the, but the only guy who has this R, yes, and he's on the, all the these. No, no, we're talking, no, no, we're talking about inside the server. No, I'm saying that the, you're getting memory, or, <laughs> you're you're getting data from a client that you want written out to a block device. It's not being written to a file system. It's being written to a block device. The client owns the file system or whatever else is in that block device. If the client wants to change that data, it's, it's the client's deal. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because our block stack has all kinds of features that rely on the data being stable. For instance, we can't easily do T10 diff if the data we're diffing can change at any moment. We can't do DM raid. We can't do all kinds of things. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure it does. But if, if it's marked as write back, it's read only. If the data is marked as write back before it's being um, DMA is being done to a disk, then it's read only. No, the only requirement is that. Uh, spark. 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 Uh, for t then dev, of course, it's required that the data is stable during the write. But if uh, t then dev is not used, it's allowed that the data is being modified while it's being uh, under DMA. Uh, but the requirement is, of course, w after all uh, changes has finished, that another write happens. I can show you the articles on LWN that describe this in detail. <laughs> stable pages discussion and mm -hmm. you solve it by copying and so if you're having a performance balance you definitely don't want to copy your unstable pages. Uh, there is a flag uh, that can be set uh, somewhere and whether or not uh, for uh, stable pages are required and that's a flag for a uh, block device. Yes, Leon said for specific SCSI devices, they use this thing. So, but in the end, if you keep the open R key, then you have to set the flags Bart was talking about and all of your IOs that say that you don't, you're not providing stable data and you need to take that penalty, whatever it may be for your configuration. So the, the convention for pages is to um, have a special page flag called page write back. And if th that means the, the page is under current write back and you're not supposed to change anything, that happened in the convention for ages. Uh, okay, you can have an exception and not go to the write back stage, but then you're not uh, a standard block uh, system anymore and you do something strange on, on the side. 
and how it evolved over time is that initially um, there was no requirement for pages being stable and some I think that under uh, Chris Mason asked to uh, require that the uh, pages would be stable during write out but that caused performance regressions for certain users and then yes. that so uh, complained about it I think that's how we ended up with the current behavior mm -hmm. that's allowed um, for most use cases to modify pages that are being written out Okay, so what I, what I know from mem memory management is that when you go to write back, the page is marked as read only from user space. And so if you get a page fault and you try to write it, then the system could invalidate that and, and cause a rewrite at the end because the, the page was modified while it was being under write back. Okay, but we still have the issue to deal with. This is not going away. So, so just for me to understand, so if, if, if you, you say that uh, after, uh, even that only the only client who has this R key is writing into that disk, I need to invalidate or I need to unregister this buffer and then register it again for reuse for, for this client. I, I don't think you actually have to fully unregister, or not unregister, but you gotta have a, a some sort of control mechanism. But I, assuming your connection is a trusted connection, you know, you've logged in and... Don't, don't allow that. Don't allow what? So? The, the thing on the other end is untrusted. It's not allowed, I mean, it can corrupt its own data, but it can't corrupt the system. It can't corrupt the system. They're using a ring buffer, essentially. Yeah. Are you, I mean, is yes. that right? You're doing it's it as a ring a buffer? Fixed set so all you have really have buffer, to do yeah. if, if to solve his problem is have a, you know, use head and tail and make sure that you don't ever, you know, you don't, you don't update your tail until the flush is complete and the other side is not allowed to write until the tail is updated. So you, yeah. you build semantics around it to provide your security, but since it's a logged in connection, you don't have to go to the whole you unregister. Have to, you have to do all this stuff, right? So if you're sending unstable data to the block layer, you need to tell the block layer it's unstable. You certainly, you certainly cannot touch that memory with the CPU. So you can only put blocks that you're gonna DMA with the block layer in there. That's the other little thing. Like you can't have a command channel or something. Well, we, 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 we just map, we, we, so, so the client, for one, the, the client wouldn't touch that, uh, that block of memory until he really receives a reply back from the server with whatever, so in some other buffer. So uh, until he gets back the reply from block layer, he never touches it. Like what do you but mean some other buffer? Some upper, uh, You said some other buffer. How does your, like this uh, yes, is we, fine well, for I have a bunch of them. So he, he has, for example, I don't know, 512 of those buffers. He sends one <laughs> buffer and then, or I can set it to one. Let's say we allocate a single buffer, then it would be just synchronous I/O. So he, he sends one, he writes one block of data and then he cannot write anything. Everything yeah, but is blocked. How do you communicate yeah. the metadata? How do you say what LBA you're writing to? So what do you mean? Like, so on top of that, there is, uh, into, into this SG list, you can put, we, we put, of course, some BIO flags. If, if you no, I mean, how it. does the client communicate to the server what BIO, the chunk of the ring buffer, or what LBA, the chunk ah, of the ring buffer? Ah, using the immediate field. That's so only 32 bits, isn't yes. it? Yes, and 32 bits is more than enough to address 512 buffers. So you never, you never ever re read your ring buffer with the CPU? No, well, no, we, we never touch the, the buffer at all. All right, now you have to set the stable stuff that Bart was talking about. But well, not if you're not going to sit there and write over your own No, it, no it's, it, it's for the block layer. The block layer has to know if it can trust the pages to be stable or not, so that when it does things that require stable pages, it can copy it. Because there's lots of scenarios where the data is not allowed to be changed, otherwise it corrupts the integrity of the stuff under the block, like T10 diff, for instance. Or when you're doing RAID calculations, you can't do a RAID calculation on a page that's constantly changing. Yeah. So that's why we have this concept of stable, not stable, and I, I guess Bart says it's evolved some more since I last looked at it. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so there is some kind of, uh, there is, well, I, 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 um, sh should I continue or? <laughs> well, I yeah. So if you're just using the immediate data yeah. for the LBA or the block number or whatever, yeah. um, are you passing in an SG list or do you have a command channel? Is there a separate communications channel besides the RDMA write buffers? 
No. So the, the only thing we have is, is RDMA buffers. In, in the immediate field, we code which buffer has been overwritten and at which offset, whatever bits are necessary there. And then the layer above IBTRS would uh, is provided with a pointer where he can find his data and inside this data there is he can find the stuff, uh, whatever sector, offset, size, whatever he wants to code there. Okay, so, so then the CPU is touching the buffer. It's just touching it at the upper layer. The IBTRS is not touching it. Yeah, that's true, yes. But the upper layer is touching the, uh, it. The upper layer is touching it, yes. Yeah. Well, he, he needs to construct a BIO out of this as Julius, so he needs to, he maps the pages to, the pages is just mapped, but he does need to construct the BIO, so he needs to at least extract the sector. And I mean, he needs to extract Sector or length, the full SG length, list. Length, offset, and... Yeah, where does that come from? It's all, in, it's embedded in the buffer. They have the command channel in front of That's the data. I said. I said, you can never touch the data with the CPU. Well, that's what I'm telling you. It reads uh, it. You can't. So, so the, so the, that means that means that we need to unregister this this thing from from RDMA before <coughs> passing it down or before accessing it at all. But Bart explained you could pass. Yeah. Bart explained you could pass the buffers to the block layer. So mm. you, you can't touch them with the CPU, but you can construct an SGL or BIO for them and pass them <laughs> to the block layer and flag them as unstable and that's supposed to work. But you can't then k-map those pages yourself and read some other metadata. You can only pass them to the block layer. You, can, you cannot access them with the CPU. Mm. We, so we allocate, on, on server side, we, we allocate all this QDEP buffer and we get the art, so DMA address. For each buffer, we have all the offsite. So the first part, we encode the protocol. So for, for in our case, IB, IBMD, so there is a BIO-related structure, which point to which buffer, and LBA and read-write operation. So Sorry, where is that? It's stored? It, it's stored in, in this big chunk of buffer. The first part is the, is save this protocol buffer and uh, the later part we... That's what I'm saying you can't do. You can't put a protocol buffer in your ring buffer without doing a validate. Mm -hmm. It's a security problem. Mm -hmm. The security problem is in the sense that nobody else would know these are, are content of your writing. Right? Well, no, that your, cli your client is untrusted, so the client can write to your control buffers while your CPU is reading them, and then you have a real problem of... If, if the client is fine with hostile. Hostile. Yeah, yeah, it's, the problem is somebody looks at your code, they figure out how your code works, they write a hostile client, they then load that up and then they log into your server and then they wait for you to get a buffer and then they turn around and dump data all over you. And so that's the problem. Your, your, your client server model is built assuming that you're always going to be connected to by the well-behaved client and because the well-behaved client is remote, it's a remote machine, you don't have physical access to the remote machine, you can't verify the client module on it, it can be a nefarious module. Right, and so the, the stance we've taken is <coughs> you're allowed to do that so long as the violations the remote side can do do not affect the operation and integrity of the local kernel. If you're reading memory with your local CPU that's under DMA control of an adversary, you have to be super duper extra careful about how you read this data and process it so that it, it's not changing under your feet. So for instance, you could copy out of the ring buffer into the CPU memory in one shot and then touch the CPU memory uh, as a copy, then you guaranteed nobody's touching it. Then you could do your stuff with it. That would be okay. Copying it using DMA? No, just copying it with the CPU. It's, it's a header or something, it's small. Yeah, yeah that part is called it. Okay. Yeah. If you if you copied it, that but would. That's what we, of course, you need to copy. Copy the pro But that's what we do. So we we of course we, we only copy. We never modify this stuff. So the CPU is touching to. We need to no, extract. I mean, I mean literally copy, as in copy byte by byte, and then access your structured data on the copy. 
but copy over CPU or, or the, I don't know. Copy with CPU. But that's the only thing we do. We, we need to copy out the offset and flange and uh, what, what else? Flags for BIO. That's now, Jason's point is you need to just do a bulk copy of the header data to a memory location that is not accessible by the R key. Once yeah. it's in a memory location not accessible by the R key, <laughs> then it can't be touched by the remote host. Then you can turn around and start parsing the data. Well, but what? You need what's called the read once semantic in our kernel. You need you need read once of the RDMA data. Uh, okay, so so I, I don't see well, what's the difference between copying it in, into one bulk or copy it byte by byte. You or need or you need the read once semantic. So if yeah. you do mem copy, that's defined to be read once. It only reads it once. Every byte's read once. If you use the read once helper macro, that's also defined to uh. be safe, sort of. Uh, but you can't just read it with the raw CPU, you get artifacts. There's a very good LWN article about okay. all these artifacts that read once is supposed to counteract. Okay, so, so the workaround for us would be to, to double check on the way we read out our control information from those buffers. You, you have to read it once, essentially. Yes, read, read it once, okay. Read once for every every byte of the control buffer. Yes. Uh, so it, it's not just mem copy this bunch and just. Or alternatively, you go ahead and unregister your memory after you get a work completion. Go ahead and do your unregister of the memory, just that one buffer. Do all the stuff you, the normal processing you have to do, and then re-register the memory probably in some just kernel thread later. So, I mean, Saggy asked you guys, Saggy asked on the list, why, why are you using a ring buffer constructor with RDMA write? Why aren't you just using send? It's almost exactly the same thing. Because we, we write from some papers that so RDMA write is faster compared to. Yeah, it's is it really? Wrong. We got to do the unregister so we lose that. Yeah. Mm. Is, is it really even faster? Yeah, yeah. But the unregistry, the invalidation exists for security purposes. So you, you can't just omit the unregistered the invalidation without <laughs> providing an, uh, a, another way to guarantee the same security properties, like read once, mm -hmm. marking pages un unstable. These are all things. But it, I'm concerned that you haven't even thought about this at all, right? So yeah. we've taken, we've spent a lot of time cleaning up our existing ULPs. I, I don't really want to merge another one that's got the same kind of security issue built into it. I have a question about another topic if this, or once the discussion about this topic is finished. Yeah, I think we've done this enough. <laughs> so uh, there's another session, there was another session this morning about atomic writes. It's a topic that keeps popping up uh, for databases because it allows to make databases more efficient. Uh, what is not completely clear to me is how writes are processed by the IB at TRS. Uh, and whether or not writes are split, and in case writes are split, how um, is it possible to support atomic writes with this protocol that span multiple physical blocks? Um, for write operation, we just, so we, we get get together list and do a full RDME write to the remote buffer. Mm -hmm. So that's it. And then, then just pass down to a to block device. And well, what do you, talk about the, this atomic right, I don't think we, we have. Um, atomic rights are supported by the NVMe spec, so. No, we don't have such okay. semantic. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess since we're running out of time, um, does anyone in the room have opinions on how we should decide if we want to merge another relatively large ULP that, what should the conditions be? I've heard people suggest that since it duplicates NVMe so very, very much, it's maybe not making sense. I've heard people say it's a lot faster than NVMe, so that makes sense. Uh, I've heard questions about the security. I've heard questions about the design. Is it a whole lot faster because it's not doing the secure thing? <coughs> well, <coughs> I can tell you what the distro is going to do or not do, as the case may be. Yeah. So 
if it never goes to a distro, this is an exercise in software. There are some optimizations possible for the upstream NVMe targets, namely uh, caching uh, SGL uh, or the buffer caching the buffer allocations that are used to receive data. Personally, I'm not opposed to a, a new ULP, but I think the, there are some obvious security, or maybe not so obvious, but there are some security issues with the current model you have right now. Mm -hmm. And those are gonna have to be addressed before it can be merged. And my guess is by the time you address those security issues, then you've got possibly even a different transfer model. You may even go away from RDMA right, rights entirely. Because the, with the send model, at least then you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, an application can't write into the, the buffer twice. It, once it's written into, it comes off the list. So the send model might be better for you guys in this case, and I don't know how much it would take you to rework that, but um, you can also fix your security while still sticking with RDMA rights, but it's absolutely gonna cost you in your performance. But uh, I'm not opposed, and especially, I like the idea that your, your transport model is separate from your block driver, mm -hmm. which makes it kind of a, a, a model, if you get it fixed and secured and working, it makes it something that could be generically used by other uh, upper layer protocols if they ever want to. And that to me is appealing. Faggy was complaining about that. He said, why are we creating more mid layers? <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't know. There's, it would be more powerful if there was more users. I don't know how much the cost is to create the mid layer, the code cost. I'm sorry. <coughs> the question was where does IBTRS sit in the, in the, in the space? That's all. It's on top of uh, RDMA CM, so it's. Inside. I, you mean in front of it? Yeah. Inside the driver to do that. Then and the block where the block device on top sits and the block. So it's, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's unfortunate Saggy wasn't able to make it because he had the most, Saggy had the most comments, I think, and had looked at it most closely of all of us. <coughs> uh, Leon, how much time is. Uh, we don't have time. We don't have time. Minus three. All right. Did you have a lot more slides, or? Um, I, I we do have more slides, but I just wanted to jump over and uh, so basically until somebody stops me. I see. <laughs> okay. Then we got to slide three. Uh, any closing remarks before we move on from you two? Well, we will certainly look into this security thing, and if. And, and look what, what is the easier way to fix that. So uh, either with atomic reads or, 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 or with switching to, to, to post send, but yeah. So if, if this is, so basically of course we, we constructed it in a, it was designed originally for a secure. Our, nobody can come and install an, an uh, infiniband equipped machine into our data center. And then write stuff into, uh, uh, but um, but basically yes, if it is a general, if it is supposed to be kind of, to be a block device where you would over whatever rocky communicate over entire internet and then anybody. So, so basically, we we don't have hostile hostile uh, clients because basically anybody hostile <coughs> would just go and destroy our servers with a hammer. It's way more easier than to write a hostile client. Right, uh, but, uh, but yeah. for the upstream kernel, if we put yeah. it in there, people will use it. And when they use it, if they don't realize that they have to have a lockdown data center, that's mm -hmm. where the hostile part comes in. Yeah. So it, you know, this is something, if you wanted to keep it in your own tree and out of the mainline kernel, you could do that and you could probably get away with these things mm -hmm. because you have physical <coughs> control over the entire cluster. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about the upstream, we have to we have to look at the security issues of people using it elsewhere. Hmm. All right then. Okay. Leon, who's next? Yuval. Hey, Thank you.
guys sitting there. Sorry. Just point myself down. Well, I guess I won't sit there. <coughs> Gracias. 
type C one works too. Uh, for a while now, and um, you can even have a split thing. This is here, and I have my controls here, my commands and everything. <laughs> so this is actually uh, the third time I'm talking about the subject matter. And uh, the second one was too technical, it just went over everybody's head. And so I'm trying to do this in a very simple way with some flashcards. Um, uh, so, um, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly if the effort that we put into it is actually worth it. So um, in some way, I, I think we have lost control of this thing. Um, we wanted, we have talked for a long time about getting continuous memory actually for the last, uh, I've talked about this for the last 15 years. Um, what's happening now in my company is we have actually systems like servers that have terabytes of uh, RAM. And they have a 100 gig uh, EDR fabric, RDMA. And uh, so what happens now, you hire a new sysadmin, comes into the company and, okay, we have some files here, five gigabytes or 10 gigabytes, just copy them around a bit. And he, of course, thing first thing he types is copy this file name to another location, right? And, and then he sits there and waits. And he gets confused. We have a 100 gig uh, EDR fabric. Why is this is a copying of a one fig four gigabyte file taking me two minutes or three minutes? And uh, then the experience system comes and says, oh, we have written this uh, copy tool that's using RDMA and, and everything, and it uses huge pages, and then run that. Okay, it takes a fraction of a second. So uh, what we have essentially is uh, a dual operating system on our machines. Um, one is the copy command for the small files, and if you have big files, you need to run the special big copy command that uh, does the big, big, big copies. And the big copy command requires large contiguous memory. And uh, the, the small command can work for the configuration files, for the executables and stuff like that. But as soon as you attach really serious uh, large data, you end up with specialized binaries that require uh, large contiguous memory. And so uh, what, since we couldn't provide any contiguous memory for user space, we still deal with these four kilobyte pages and many operations. And uh, the interesting thing is also these systems deteriorate over time. When you first boot them, there's a lot of contiguous memory. And if you allocate, uh, let's say, uh, 100 for kilobyte pages, they're all in sequence. And when you submit them to the disk for I.O., the I.O. system can correlate them and make them all into one request. And that kind of ability deteriorates as time passes and the memory gets defragmented. And so on Fridays, after seven days of operation, or maybe five days of operation, the system is sluggish. So uh, we always reboot everything over the weekend. <laughs> that's, 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 yes, right. <laughs> and so on Monday, everything is fast again, and you have contiguous memory. <laughs> that's, 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 so, uh, so what we're ending up now, and the, end, the new thing also now is, okay, we got into the first systems with really high capacity, and then the experience system came to me and said, the system is not working anymore. It's, it's constantly having these hiccups. And so we looked at it, okay, well, the system has four terabytes of RAM. That gives, gives you one billion four kilobyte pages. If you don't use huge pages, then once in a while, the kernel starts scanning the, its, bil its billion <laughs> pages, <laughs> and it takes a while until it can do something for the user again. So um, <laughs> what, 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 what we've done in that, in that case is just, okay, we mu every system must be configured to uh, that most of the memory will be huge pages. 
And once you do that, and it's just four gigabyte left for the kernel on 4K pages, the system behaves in a predictable way again as fast because you only have one million of these uh, 4K pages to slosh around in the, in the kernel. So uh, the contiguous memory problem is, uh, is going uh, further and further, and I think we have kind of lost control of, of these things. I'm not going to show what happens if I actually in three or four years get some 16 or 30 gigabytes, 30 terabyte systems. This must be getting much, much worse. So actually what we are seeing what's happening in our production environment is we are end ending up with a two-tiered system where we have tools for that operate on two of on, on, on two Mac pages, and then we have a standard tools that work on four kilobyte pages. So we have this dual thing going on. Um, so that's pretty uh, bad, actually. Um, with transparent huge page and stuff, I think we thought we could get that um, under control, but we're, we're not making any progress there. So. Um, we must have huge pages, otherwise the system slows down, we can't really get the performance we want. And the system actually starts sloshing and, and um, doesn't work in an optimal way anymore. Um, yeah. So then we have uh, done some efforts to uh, provide uh, automatic uh, defragmentation in the past. There's logic in the kernel to defrag uh, uh, multiple 4K pages that are uh, contiguous and kind of bring them back into a huge page, back and forth. That has had some success, but uh, still over time, there are certain 4 kilobyte pages that are pinned in memory and that cause a breakdown of the ability to uh, uh, recreate uh, uh, huge pages. And that's why even with these uh, optimistic mechanisms, we can uh, never really pr fully prevent that and thus reboot. And this also this means also in the week we may have a need for a reboot because uh, you, not, you need to run a different application on the system that has a different uh, requirements on huge pages. Since you cannot rec reclaim the huge pages, uh, you will have to reset the uh, boot-up configuration to an another set of huge pages, and then you reboot the system, and it comes up, and then it can run your application. So this uh, all gets more and more awkward. Um, so um, I, I've kind of left this pretty uh, simple. I'm not sure where you want where you want to go with this. I can go in more detail on the efforts that we've done uh, to provide more contiguous uh, memory and how to reconstruct contiguous memory. And uh, we've been trying this now for over a decade. Uh, but we don't have enough uh, people behind this, and we don't have enough urgency to actually address the, is the issue. Everybody's trying to do something, some optimistic te techniques here and there but the fundamental thing is not being addressed. And I think the fundamental thing is that the objects in the kernel are not movable. So at some point, when you have a, uh, an object that you constantly use, it will prevent uh, creating contiguous sections across that area. This is particularly true for files. So inodes and dentries are uh, one of these uh, things. Uh, so uh, as the system opens files, these are created, and you can't move them afterwards anymore. So they pin pages, which will pin, uh, make sure that the whole six series of uh, section of memory can no longer be reclaimed as a huge page. And uh, so over time, these uh, uh, locations in memory develop that where you cannot con create contiguous memory anymore, and this proliferates and ultimately leads to the end of this thing. So what I've been trying to do uh, when I had some time is create um, ways to make these objects movable. And uh, that has had some success, but it's not really c complete. And um, it seems that uh, people don't think that this is uh, too important. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how to continue with, with this whole thing. And it seems that the uh, practical things are more going to uh, this dual uh, system of 4K pages and uh, 2 Mac pages. So um, I don't know what to con how to continue this matter here and what to do in the, in the future, but maybe uh, it's inevitable that we do this dual tiered system. Anybody have any comments on this? Have you guys ever experiment? Have you guys ever experiment? I'm sorry. Have you guys ever experimented? Um, yes, well, yeah. um, have you guys ever experimented where um, you have that same philosophy, but you always allocate small blocks from like low range going up and large blocks from 
high range going down. So hoping the two will balance as the system goes, or most small ones. You're talking ones. about uh, memory management. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There have yeah. been all sorts of uh, methods uh, being implemented in the kernel. That's a huge push, push these days. <laughs> so those have been, those have failed? They had limited success. A limited success, yeah, thanks. The, the problem is always that at the end, some uh, objects are created that are pinned and that then prevent uh, the uh, uh, re Right, but system. if you're always allocating small objects because they're the ones that are breaking up your two mm -hmm. megs from a lower region mm -hmm. working up, your big requests always come from the top and yes. come and go and keep things contiguous, and your small ones always, even if they lock down, are only taking smaller pieces. And yeah, that's actually this strategy of just taking the huge pages from high memory and you're going to take the other slab objects from uh, lower memory. Yes. Right, mm -hmm. and that hasn't worked either? It has. It improved the situation, yes. Oh, okay, thanks. But uh, it's not a total solution, so uh, the problem is, uh, as time progresses, memory becomes more, uh, there's more, comes more, more, there's more, more quantity of, of memory. There's more tools. There's more system diagnostics running. There's more usage of the memory subsystem. So this gets compensated as things get more complicated, mm -hmm. and the old situation is then reconstructed and then gets worse over time. So this has been going on for a long time, and we've seen this again and again. So any uh, progress we make is going to be uh, undone by the growth of the memory capacities. I, I take it the problem here is that two meg pages get cannibalized whenever you're running out of 4K pages. And so it'll yes. transition <laughs> a two meg page to 4K pages. Uh -huh. Then it'll allocate something that stays there and then it can't reconstruct it. Yes. That's the problem, That's right? That's a typical thing, yes. So if you know the uh, type of stuff that normally gets pinned, if it comes from specific caches or whatever, uh, could yeah, you no. force those to go into the... Uh, not come from a cannibalized two meg page? Yes, of course. Uh, I know the dentrix is a typical use case here. Yeah. Uh, we've tried various approaches like that, but then the, if the load changes, you will find operation and you need a huge, huge number of dentrix and inodes to search through a file system, then suddenly you will run out of memory because you don't allow the expansion of the uh, inode dentrix caches and stuff like that. So there's, there's weird uh, system conditions uh, occurring. Has, has, has people explored? making the KMIM caches use huge pages exclusively? Uh, I'm the author of these things, and I have a kernel option. You can set a, set a kernel option, and the system will come up with huge pages for the slabs. And that helps a little bit, too, I suppose you're going to It causes that. more memory use, and uh, uh, it will be very fast for a while, but uh, at some point you won't be able to have enough memory anymore for the other things. Oh, you run out of memory in that case. Yes, but, but for, for the 4 terabyte system, it's not a problem. <coughs> but for if you have a system with just 4 gigabytes, then you may run into some issues. <laughs> so, well, my next question is, has anybody tried putting the thought about putting these KMM caches in uh, virtual map? Uh, we've had approaches like that. I've done approaches like that in 2008, 2009, yes. And, and we had some problems with some device drivers that actually wanted physical objects and physical addresses. For yes. dentries? Oh, that's fine, not for dentries, but, for, but the, the, the slab allocator is supposed to provide d DMA able objects to the device drivers. And if you do a, a K malloc and the stuff is not DM DMA able, then you have an issue with lo lots of device drivers in the kernel. That, this sounds like it goes back to the whole get user pages thing, but except it's not get user pages, get kernel pages. Yeah, right, it's another issue on the lower object level that I have to deal with. You just deal with the big ones, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, yeah, the, the ideal thing that, that I want to do, which would be best to have callbacks with each subsystem and make sure that these objects are movable. You mean like a KMM cache callback? Well, we have that, yes. don't we? I have. I forgot, we did propose that, that API. Uh, the the uh, IO <coughs> subsystem guys are not very fond of that, and, they, I, and I, really, I don't know how to make an inode and a gentry movable because the locking is so obscure and so convoluted. I think it's about 15 levels of so of various uh, <laughs> layers that you have to get to that, and you can't really touch the object unless you come from a certain list. So uh, this has been uh, uh, very difficult to uh, get any, any cooperation on that level. Have, have you considered sending a machine with four terabytes of RAM and IBs to <laughs> would have to send him a cluster and we're getting into some millions of dollars here. Yeah. Just, yeah, just two. <laughs> just two. Send it to Al Zero. Send it to Al Zero. Right. Did that thousand people. 
Did, did we get to the point where, like, can RCU tree nodes, or sorry, re X array tree nodes be movable now? Have we yeah, the X array is implemented, and it's actually, uh, it, th these objects are movable, and I have patches that will make all of this work. But it's not been merged yet. Uh, not really much, no. Yeah, there are some, some pieces of the X-ray that have been merged. It's not complete there yet. Matthew is still working on it, and my stuff is going on top of his stuff. And so we have to wait until that's uh, all done. And then we have the X-ray movable. But what I really need to move is the inode and dentries. So uh, I can probably get a bit of a foothold there, but I think I'm, we don't get five years or so until everything is being merged. And uh, while that's going on, we have to do this dance with the huge pages. Um, yeah. And I found another solution, right. The other thing is uh, this problem goes away if your CPU manufacturer would just, stop, would just start giving you larger page sizes. So if you run a Power 9 system with 64K pages or an, an ARM system with 64K pages, this problem doesn't exist. Actually, uh, the copy operation works fine on ARM systems and it also does on Power 9. You mean, you mean you run the whole system with 64K pages? Yes, right. Right. That's what we do on our... ARM 64s, they use 64K yeah, pages. Yeah, um, small ARM. Um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, have you tried doing a kind of um, scaled or discrete step thing that you said the problem you can't use, use pages on four gigs, so size the number of huge pages based on the size of memory. So, as right. memory hits terabyte numbers, it's an obvious yeah. when to have huge pages. It, doesn't sound like it's nearly any advantage to do it on four gig because there's too much churn going on in that small amount, what we now think is a small amount of memory. Yeah, but you have all this legacy stuff that you have and uh, written for you for the right, last decade so I, that you still, run, you If you still anymore. have legacy and you do the, the idea that I mentioned of small stuff and low memory and big stuff and high, mm -hmm. and you start splitting it up based on size of memory, you know, at, yeah. at 512 meg, it's this one. It's, it doesn't have to be linear, it can be non-linear based on some <coughs> heuristic that you've learned over time, that this is the typical huge page property of multi-terabyte systems, you know, versus this is the heuristic that works for a typical, yeah. you know, 64 this gig or less. Right? Yeah. 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 Right, right. Yeah, 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 right, right. I mean, <laughs> put, you know, math is a wonderful thing. <laughs> I think this is not a new new problem. I, I encountered this first in the early 90s. So <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think maybe, I don't know exactly how it works now, but is, is there any way to incentivize uh, by kind of categorizing uh, blocks into, or memory into some memory that can, that, that are uh, for Reuse that where you require. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, the kernel core parameter has been there since 2005, I believe, uh, where Mel Gorman has implemented a limit, and uh, you, you must have a certain area of, of kernel memory that has to be uh, reclaimable. You cannot pin mm. anything in that area. That exists, and so it, is it, it causes a lot of memory issues if you try to use it. <laughs> yeah, so that's why. So it has to be set to a default value that well will force people to actually implement. Uh, Moving. Have you, once you yeah. set this thing, you need to know and to know how your worker behaves and what kind of uh, sizes are right. required. And once you cross this boundary, you will get an OOM. And you need to know how to deal with the system. So you need to employ a specialist to handle this thing, this situation. I yes. see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't send it this way. <laughs> okay. All right. Are there any, uh, any other questions from Christoph? If anybody wants to help and uh, get engaged in a long term project, uh, talk to me. <laughs> yes, and I, I know we're always interested in this in RDMA because the, the DMA lists and things, all the hardware works a lot better if it's processing like continuous memory. Everything right. gets faster, not just the CPU and not just, yeah, just everything just, gets faster. Just to think about it, you do an operation on a four, gilo, four gigabyte of, of data. And so if you have a four kilobyte system, uh, you're potentially sending about one million of these uh, uh, get together entries to the device. Usually devices support maybe 100,000 or so. So you, you're getting chunks submitted to the device and you're allocating huge uh, areas of memory just for the descriptors. There have been situations in the past where we had a run out of memory because we couldn't have enough continu didn't have continuous memory to store the tables to describe this request sent it to a disk. So the, uh, the, the tables that are sent to the disk have been virtualized as well and they have no reallocated virtual memory because they can be larger than four kilobyte pages could be a gigabyte that we need for the descriptors to send yeah. it down to the devices. And then you have and tables and tables. All sorts of weird stuff going on with that one. 
So uh, if you have two MAC pages, you cut this uh, by uh, 512, and uh, so you reduce it significantly. The ideal thing would be, of, would be of course, if it would be dynamic, <coughs> you can specify the order of these things. Uh, would it be an idea to, to do more of kind of uh, software page sizes, uh, maintain the pages in, like, let's say, two pages at a time? type of thing? Uh, that has been done yeah, in 2003, 2004 by, by, by one guy. <laughs> and in 2007, I had my implementation. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think <laughs> I recall so this all ran like against that. the same yeah. problem of, of the defragmentation. If you have multiple page sizes and you manage it, yeah. and at some point you cannot longer ac allocate the larger page sizes. Right. Same thing with huge pages. Mm. If you have more than two, two different types, then it gets, probably it gets even worse and, and it gets down the hill faster. But uh, you said 64K works, so if you have software, 64K. No, th th K no, no, 64 is the smallest yeah. page size. It's the uniform page size. Yeah, yes, I understand the that. But if you do the software, you just make the smallest allocator be 64K on a yeah, so 4K, that solves the problem because that's, that's what you get today. That I um, can do that because it keeps the page state for a 64K of pages in the first page table entry. Intel cannot do that. It keeps the state in very distributed over 16 or so entries, and the VM ha must have an atomic way to update the various stages of, of, the, of the page table. And that all these products failed on this uh, account. It got extremely complex to handle the, the page state modifications by the CPU and synchronize that with the kernel. Okay. If they're not atomic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and these things are at the very low level, nested in an extreme high, and some other locking structures. And if you do that and you get some, some issue, you can't recover. We are beset on all sides by locking. <laughs> <laughs> so if Intel would adopt the ARM approach and put the status in the first of the, of the page table structures, we could do this. Actually, we have code in, in already in, in, in ARM that does this. But anyway, um, I've been trying to get to the CPU team for, for, for Intel for a while, and uh, they've always said that, that their way is the best way, and they can't change it. It's all in has been there for decades now, and it works well, well very well optimized and stuff. Optimized. <laughs> optimized. <laughs> yes, it's optimized for ghosts. Okay. Okay. All right, moving on. This is the, this talk is about um, uh, a new proposal here, for, uh, so if you look anyone hear me? Closer. Because I'm not hearing myself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, oh, okay, closer. Um, for a proposal for how to share um, a hardware object between more than two processes. Um, funny thing is that I came here uh, with the knowledge that I'm the only user and then I met Alex and I came to learn that there, are, uh, there is a parallel effort, similar effort uh, for that and they have a um, different approach. So I will um, go fast on the slides and then if Alex can join me and then we can show the differences between the two approaches. Um, historically, this is um, used by Oracle um, for some time. Um, Shamir was the one that took the, uh, uh, <coughs> the effort to upstream this uh, uh, project. And uh, I just pulled because Shamir, unfortunately, can no, can no longer work on this project. I was pulled into it. Uh, so here's the things that I'm going to talk. Mo mostly I'm going to touch the use case as, as I see it, and then I will go over the API, how um, different process can uh, uh, get the, the objects. 
So here's the thing. Um, uh, consider a, a huge server with a huge amount of memory and many, many processes that serves client requests. Uh, and it, it, each one of the process have uh, create its own MR. So the hardware needs to handle all, all of these uh, thousands MR. So maybe maybe a better approach would be that one process will create one or maybe few MRs, and it will share it with uh, some other process, as 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 like is sharing the shared memory. Um, mm -hmm. So so then the the other processes can use this uh, MR and serve their clients. So we only have only one or few uh, MRs. Yeah, maybe I can stop here for a discussion because this is the use case, and I, uh, I sent some feedbacks on the list on that, like uh, security things, because we are sharing uh, a context and PD and MR between a uh, few processes. So, I mean, it's a little unusual that you're sharing kind of access to process memory, but it, it doesn't strike me as a security thing because the process, uh, all the sharing was mediated with file descriptors already. And you can, there's all kinds of ways you can share process memory using file descriptors, like with uh, file backed MMAPs and things. So it's not, it's not completely out of left field. You mean it's not a big hole, like any way you can share memory between processes, so. Well, that's what RDMA does here. Yeah. You're creating an RDMA object that shares the memory of the process and then giving it to a remote user. Why Why would you tell me there's a security problem to give that same object to a local user? It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think there's a security concern here. I mean, so long as it's all constrained by file descriptor passing and, um, you know, with the understanding that if you have access to the file descriptor, you have access to all this stuff that's in it. Yeah. including the memory maps and the R keys and, and so forth. Uh, uh, anyway, to achieve that, the two processes have to share the memory itself. I mean, not only the MR. So if they can share the memory, the MR is the next step anyway. Um, so we have some in solving Shmem solutions. We have some cases where we're not even sharing the memory. We're just sharing the MR. Each process places its part of the data in its memory, but one process will send a scatter gather with all the memory from all the processes, even without sharing it. So, so, so one process will do the transmission the, yeah. uh, on behalf, on of, behalf the of all the rest of the processes, yeah. So, so there's no real memory sharing between them, but there is sharing of the PD and MR, so, so one can do the transaction. So, how, so, so one process will do the transmission only, yeah. how, how the other processes will let them that they know that they're ready. It might be some, some signaling some sort of or, or oh, yeah, okay, see. some sort of signaling of some so kind. They are not separated. Like uh, behind you, Alex. the logic Alex. is, is so, so the logic is central. The logic is central. So if you have like thousand pro processes, you have to schedule between them. So so in that case, how are, are you doing that with a single memory? Registration, or do you? Because each process has to register their piece of that, right? No. So, so this is a model we want to get to. Oh, okay. um, we have Yuval is working on one model. We wanted to work on a very similar but slightly different model. So um, you can have each process share its own. Uh, M key. Well, they have to share a PD between all the processes. Sure. Each one registers its own memory, but just passes the L key uh, to the orchestration process to do the, the transmission. So he bundles them up and does a single. Yeah, and, and obviously okay. each one has to signal when its data is ready in some way, or or if it's an incoming message to separate the data and tell them it's ready. All right. Okay. So I think the whole use case for this originally was that. Uh, that there is a limited amount of MRs, and uh, so there's a resource issue really that's solved by this. It's possible to to have more processes accessing the same amount of memory with uh, fewer MRs, basically. So that I think that's kind of the root of it. So I, I don't think there's a real limit on MRs. I mean, they're huge. Um, there is a performance penalty 
Yeah, but I mean, there, there is a performance penalty if you register the same shared memory for each process with its own M key, so you're, you're abusing maybe the amount of M keys for the same memory region, and if they're all sharing it, so it's simpler. I mean, the, the penalty on the hardware, the penalty on everything is larger. Yeah. Yes, but still, that's, that was the, that, I think that's the use case so that they have in the database. So. <laughs> But still, it's it will be much better, like a design like this of the process that okay. But I mean, implicit in this is if you're sharing the MR, then you've also shared the PD. So you're, you're putting all of these processes in the same security domain, same PD. Yes. And this is everybody understands that this is what's happening. Yeah. So, kind of my next question is. Why can't you just share the the, the singular u verbs context FD? Why do you need? Yeah, it's actually based on I, that. I, I second that. Oh, okay. No. That I mean, because I mean that gets back to my talk earlier. Because yeah. you know, for what I'm working on, just sharing these little memory registration objects kind of breaks my architecture where that doesn't get tracked. But if you just shared the whole context protection domain file descriptor, then everything's just beauty and I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. So, yeah, I'm a, that's, yeah, that's why I'm a little concerned with your path set on the list, but I'm not saying that what you are trying to do isn't wrong, it's just that I think maintaining the file descriptor model is important for a number of reasons. Well, I, can you, do you need, can you, use a single file descriptor, or do you need these things in distinct file descriptors? Yes, but still, how the, uh, the other process uh, get uh, handled, not the handle, the, the object, the, so, the PD itself, it has the context. Okay. So, Yuval, I think this is the difference between what yeah. we discussed, where we're, I mean, we see this as a single business logic running just on multiple processes. So if, if a main process passes the FD to all the other processes, they share the same kernel context. There's it's like just running different threads in the current design. Um, there's just the issue of how do these separate user space contexts reproduce the, the verb handles in, in their user space area. But, but then there's no security between the processes. They're all sharing the same U context. All the objects are shared. Each one can maybe destroy or ruin. But again, it's like a multi-thread model where you, I mean, we, we discussed this and you have to maybe check with the rest of the, your team is this security between the processes required in some way? I mean, I can create a PD, I can pass it to you, but you're not going to tell me additional information or, of how you're going to use it, or maybe I'll pass it. So yeah. it's behind you. No. But, but, but one thought. suggestion on that is you pass the FD, like we're talking about, but then we have additional calls that say, I want, now that I've got this FD, I want access to this object. And no, there's no, we can't. We can't do that. So, so, so Why? If you have the FD, you have access to everything in it. That's that's like Unix. If you, I'm okay with that, but I'm I, but he doesn't want to share everything. Is that is that true, or, or can that, you share that, everything? That's what my thought, and I think this okay. is the difference between the two. But I'm not sure that that is correct. So idea here is that one process create the context is uh, sharing the FD context, but then. The, the second process has its own context that it, crea it can create some other PDs on top of the other. So, so see, if, if, if the second process will yeah, use the wh shared why, context, why, 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 does, why does a second PD need to be in Maybe. the same new context as the first? That well, not the same. I mean, an, an extra but, one. But you can't so share the memory regions you across can open that two protection FDs, domain. Right? You can open a private FD and a shared FD. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. And, and do its work on the private. Uh, uh, but they have to be in the same protection domain, so no. only if they're going to use that MR. Well, I mean that's what we're talking about. Well, that's, using that's the same point. MR. If you're going to use the MR, then all of your IB objects have to be in the same protection domain, yeah. and of course they can influence each other in sort of unpredictable ways because the model for security is the protection domain is the barrier. You can't go outside your protection domain, mm -hmm. but there's nothing to say you can't. I mean. You could invalidate any M key in that protection domain. You could, who knows what you could do to the QPs and onwards, onwards. Right. I so think, as I soon as you have this, as soon as you have this private FD, 
as soon as you allow him access into that protection domain, he is, this, yeah. I mean, he has yeah. access to everything. So it might as well just be a dupe of the FD. No, I think it's not a matter <laughs> of security here. It's not, oh. I'm trusting the other process. This is why I gave him the, the FD. Okay. But then who handled the reference counting of the object? In his model, there is only one user object and each one of them can destroy the object. Well, I think, I think we oh. need to solve that problem. And if we're going to solve that problem independently of having to do funny things with FDs, I think that would be OK. And my suggestion when, when I heard what Alex was talking about is I said, well, why don't we just dupe the U object inside the same FD? So we have two IDR entries pointing to the same hardware object. And then we can do reference counting the way we want. And everything's OK. Oh. And that, that Seems like it might work. Don't you inherently I'm not sure I get that though? So, so, I mean, so you mean there will be the, the U file? Yeah, but if you have two processes, so you would have like two IBVPDs, and each process can destroy it, but there's only one kernel instance. So that's so you have to have a reference, or as Jason suggested, two U objects in the kernel to represent them. So I, I, we're talking about two different things here. First of all. The security model, are we OK with sharing everything? Because that's inherent at the moment you share the FD. Yeah. And, and then the implementation details, which no, there are some issues no, there to resolve. There is no issue of security, I right? Think I think that actually that dovetails into the security model. If I can close your memory region, I mean, th that's part of what you're opening yourself up to here, is that if I'm allowing you another process to take control well, no, of I this. Mean, there, there's allowing for a security thing, and then there's, there's, there's the next step is making it possible to write a correct application that has the semantics you want. And for that, you really do want ref counting. You want to say, I've shared this MR to a bunch of places. They're going to cooperate. Well, they're going to play by the rules, and everything will work out. So that's kind of where my IOCTL just off the top of my head idea was is that this other process could say, hey, I want to take a reference to this or something that says, okay, you know, I don't want this to go away even if somebody else closes it. But I mean, I, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Because in my, in, I don't know, in my very simplistic view, I'm like, if you're sharing this across this, you have to have some communication between the processes so that they're not closing memory regions out from each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just, but still, you want the process to say, oh, I'm done with that memory region. If everybody else is done with it, delete it. I mean, you need that kind of semantic exactly. to make this actually workable. Not necessarily. Yeah, I think so. I mean, so. they can do that on their own, though. They can communicate, hey, we're all done with this memory region, and they somebody could, destroys it. But then you're it. creating a big mess for them. You've created a feature that's kind of half unusable. And I, I, I've been thinking some more about Alex's thought. And I think it would be relatively easy to put what I'm going to call like a proxy U object in the IDR. Well, it's an X-ray now, in, in the X-ray that would be owned by the other processes. And somehow, the, the, this proxy one would refer back to the, the real one. And you could build the ref counting that way and keep everything kind of in track. Uh, but so, uh, still, that's on the whole global. So you, what you really want is per MR, per, you know. How about, how about saving this reference count in the uh, hardware object? And that's it. Well, we're not, we're not, no, we're not, no, reference, I mean in the IB we're not reference counting the hardware object. We're reference counting that IDR entry is how our system works. So when you destroy that IDR entry, we need to somehow decide when it, when it goes away or not. We may be able, maybe we can just put a reference count in the U object. And well, even better reference count in the, in the file, right? Well, the file's reference count is just fine, but there's so, sub-objects yeah. in the file that we're keeping track of. That, the file holds many, many IB objects, right? And each of them needs to be kept tracked. So, so maybe how, I don't know. So okay. So how about we take a step back? Let's talk about how we share these objects. So we we said we shared the the protection domain by sharing the file, but then if I want you to use one of my memory regions, I have to share my L key, etc. So when that happens, well, no, I want I want to see a model where if you're going to use an object, you share the object. So you you need to share the PD, obviously. And you need to share the MR, obviously. Okay. And the, the okay. L key comes uh, along. Yeah, you with didn't the let me finish, but like I have to communicate that information to you. When I do that, that's sharing the object that increases a ref count on it, right? And then there's some other reciprocal call that says, "Okay, I'm done with it." Like I can hand it to you, and I can say I'm done with it. That decrements it, and now you own it. And then you know. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's what we should do. Whatever. That that 
but, makes some sense. But I think to get back to my talk, if you do that, like if I were to share it with you and then I drop my reference, then my reference should drop from the U file, right? No, the U file is linked to the file descriptor. If you have the file descriptor in your processes FD table, you have a reference to it. Yes, Period, but full does stop. my memory, re <laughs> if I ha share a memory region to you, and hand it off to you, and I don't, and I want to drop my reference to that memory region. You can't do that. It's not. You're not. You're not actually doing anything. Okay. You're just. There's still one U file, and the kernel doesn't know which processes have this U file. We're just giving a tool to user space to manage reference counts in a slightly different way. Okay, but my point is that what you're proposing is that if I, okay, getting back to my talk, if I register a file and I pin it. And then I hand it off to you, and I'm not owning it anymore. Like I'm, there, I'm okay with saying both processes own it, but that's not what he wants. I no, it is what he wants. No, he said he wants to hand it off, and maybe one process doesn't own it anymore. Right? Somebody has to be responsible for this thing. Well, right? no, yes, it gets handed off to somebody else. We don't in, in this motion. We in RDMA we don't really have a concept of an, of an owner. The the yes, struct. The no, I, I think no. it's the reference count module. Uh, that, that's my understanding of it. It's a reference count right? model. We don't have yeah. a concept yeah. of an owner. I shared with you and I lowered my reference count, so it's yeah. accessible. We're in the same use context anyway. We, yeah. don't, we don't really care who is the owner, just we're counting how many owners we, we have. So the last one will disp dispose the, pro the object. Um, Give him the mic, I think, please. Yeah. It's not so much who owns it, who doesn't own it. It's who can use it. You can use and it. Who's you holding have the file. That yeah. And who's if, holding that registration. If you have the struct file in your FD table, you can use it. That's it. That's, that's, that's the extent of it. OK, so why do we need to ref count it? If, if we have multiple files that are referencing that, ref count's taken care of. The, the issue is you want to make the applications easier to write, and the applications want different models. Some of the models are, all the applications are sharing the same file descriptor, but in some cases, one application might be responsible for a certain subset of objects, the other application for a non-overlapping subset, and then there's some objects where maybe they're jointly responsible. Okay. For. And this is like and a ref count model, ref count model. Okay, but that, but that, back to my talk, if you have a file that's pinned in some of those that's only being used in one application and he's done with them, which process does the system and kill? All of them. The only way to forcibly destroy that thing that you created is to, to close the uverbs file. The only way to close it is to destroy every single process that's holding it open. Okay. We, we don't have a fine grain kill for RDMA. You can't just target so, one MR and kill it. So, yeah, okay. So I don't understand why you're introducing all this complexity then. But it's to make okay. the program. It's to make the applications easier to write. It's easier to write if the kernel provides the small amount of shared memory for the reference count than you try and build the reference count using some kind of crazy RPC thing. Because that's a very difficult application model. I'm, yeah. I, don't, I won't argue that point. I agree with you, but I, I kind of feel like if you don't have a reference to this object, you're, you shouldn't. You have yeah. a reference. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about how do we create but a reference. But if you don't, if you drop that reference, then it should be dropped. OK. I, I, maybe we're just saying the same thing, but we're still talking about it. I don't know. So I mean, I, I, think, mean I think the. First of all, the question to answer is if, if you can accept a shared FD instead of unique FDs. Because the original patches Samir posted had multiple uverbs FDs. Every process had its own uverbs FD and its own X array with its own list of U objects in it. And some of those U objects were the same U objects as they were in other people's lists. That's very complicated. If you can tolerate a single U context, a single IDR in all of your processes. That's immensely simplifying. I don't have the answer now, uh, so but I'm promised to check. I, uh, this I'm is it. This is your homework. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it, 
I think that sounds uh, somewhat are, are reasonable. You, are you from familiar with the, uh, a little bit, yes, uh, from the earlier version. I, I worked on uh, on trying to implement it or just support it with Ziff. Mm -hmm. So so I'm familiar with it. And it, it, the version we had didn't work <laughs> quite. It was it had its problem. The one that we were trying to so to support. Uh, but I mean, his suggestion like mm -hmm. used the same context. Probably better now. Hmm? Right, we're kind of looking, I know you guys are looking at this from the perspective of an out-of-tree kernel patch you've already written that does this other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's created a lot of work and complexity in the kernel. I don't really like the complexity that's developing around the way the U objects are reference counted. That started to go into ugly town. Uh, but I sure. think, I think, I haven't thought about it a lot because I only learned about it yesterday, but I think we might be able to add this reference counting concept mm -hmm as an additional layer on the existing U objects in a way that doesn't break everything. And that sounds like a good idea to me intuitively, but I'm not, uh, I would of course so need to look at it. If more. we keep going down that line, then the semantic that I, I keep asking about, I, I even asked this for, for Shamir's patches, it is in RDMA core, I want this concept of like import from the kernel, import from the kernel the user space information I need. So tell me what the L key is, tell me how to reconstruct the IBV PD, tell me how to reconstruct the IBV MR in my local process. Mm -hmm. And that would be a reasonable place to put the ref count, and that would be a reasonable place to put a mirror that's to decrement that ref count. It's weird, it's really, really weird, but maybe we could make it work, I'm not sure. Yeah, so just a few points. So from security, one of the things we discussed was that once I pass the FD, that second process can access my resources and destroy them. Uh, so, so I sort of gave up on security the moment I gave the FD to the other process, even if it wanted to import the PD to its own context, a U context. Um, and then the PD and the MR are pretty much stateless, so it's very pretty simple to expose them. Obviously, sharing a QPCQ data path, it's a different story altogether. I mean, it's not your topic, but I'm just looking at the broader sense. Yeah. And even the context itself, um, as a vendor provider, we have on the MLX context some stateful objects that we'll have to solve because the moment you gave the FD, you want to probably reconstruct the user space IBV context, and it has some stateful meaning in it. Like the private. Yeah, yeah. Dr driver-specific stuff that yeah. we'll have to probably deal and see how do we do, and every vendor will... <laughs> probably have to solve its context issues because yeah, the, the PD right. and MR are, are the simple part at the end but of it. But that's more constrained because we can yeah. now say, well, the vendor has to provide, well, the provider driver has to provide an import and the kernel has side has to provide a, a data dump that can allow the import. Yeah. And if you have state in your objects, then you probably have to add kernel APIs to you know, move that state into the kernel basically because that's the only way we could share it. Mm -hmm. uh, none of this sounds insurmountable to me, to me and it, it seems to make the mess less because we're making the mess a lot less than trying to create these weird shared object things. The weird shared object things creates a lot of problems for the way we destroy the world when you try and destroy a PD, but you can't because an MR and some other FD is holding it open. Ah, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, it means we have to constrain the user space so that it can't like import an MR unless it's already imported the the PD, which is starting to get really complicated because we don't actually have a formal way to traverse this graph of dependencies in, in our U object system. The assumption is, is that all the U objects in the dependency graph are inside a single IDR, and if we destroy that IDR and all the U objects in a multi-pass thing, that everything will just get deleted. If we can't rely on that assumption, ah, it's become a big mess. And you guys haven't even started to think about how to deal with that in the patches I saw. That's yeah. They were sort of like, well, if everybody does, so. I hope you can say you can tolerate this model because I think we can implement that fairly easily. The the U context is the worst of the lot. That That's hard. That needs a little thinking. But on the flip side is if you have millions of processes, which is what you just said, mm -hmm. then sharing the U context is also going to help you reduce resource usage because there is a resource affiliated with the U context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and so you might end up winning. I don't know. Yeah. So again, okay. So if, if you share if you share the context and you have access to all the memory regions in the context, 
do I have to take a reference on it to use it? Why not? Well, no, technically no. You don't need to have okay. a reference because okay, the, now I understand what you're talking about. The struct file is giving you all the reference you need, but if you want to coordinate your a timely destruction between multiple processes, then you would want to take the reference and then you can drop somebody it when needs you're to done with it. Well, somebody needs to provide a reference. But, but, but wait, what, what about okay. the reference? Fair, of fair the, enough. Now I understand what your model. What about the reference of the MR itself? Like the second process can kill your MR. Don't do that. Okay, you yeah, can't control, yeah. you know, Basically, you, you, the, the process just the died. Process okay, the process, twice. but, but yeah. the process just died, and all this, all his resources are dying with him. So, so, so the DMR will be dying. No, right? no, 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 we're in a file descriptor model. A, the, the death of a process ah, does not close alive, the file descriptor. Uh, okay. Now, he might orphan all of his stuff when he dies, and that might be a really legitimate reason why you don't want this kind of model. Now you have to stand on the side and draw it with your face to the camera and your pen to the board. <laughs> oh, on the... On the I think that's probably what does sync it. is Because it, um, I think the model that Oracle has is these independent processes are largely independent and they're going to create a whole bunch of QPs and other stuff for their own uses. And if they crash, all the stuff that hasn't been shared does need to be cleaned up. Yes? I think so. So you do actually so, need the separation. Yeah, just for resource cleaning if something crashes. Yes, because you need... You, you don't want to close all the processes to do proper cleanup. Yeah. You just want to keep the, the shared resources sort of nebulously floating out there. So, 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 so. They, they, anyway, they are going to need two contexts, like one with the shared well, one you can't, and one with the private one. You can't. It's useless. You, you can't reference the MR that you shared unless you create a QP inside the PD and you can't do that with another context, it just, it's useless. So mm -hmm. you, you do really want the weird FD passing thing that you were about to explain in your slides, <laughs> which is mm, just for the, just just for for the cleanup. resource cleanup. Because uh, the, their model is if one, they lose one process, that's OK. They start it up again. The model you're talking about, you lose a process, you kill everybody, you clean oh, up I, the mess. I, I, only when all the process dies, the file object destroyed, and then everything is cleaned up. But if the if one process dies, the QPs and whatever it created are orphans, as you said. They hang there. Nobody knows about them. Right. But I mean, nobody in, can clean them up. In his use model, that would be a memory leak. In yeah. a Shem Shmem use model, you, if you lose a process, you expect that everybody's going to get killed and cleaned up anyway because that's how Shmem works. Yeah. So it makes sense. You you don't have a resource leak because. You're not going to respawn that process. It's just gone. OK, that's very sad. So we have um, to do the messy FD thing. You should go to the rest of your slides. No, uh, I think I'm, I'm done, because this is the, the uh, discussion that I wanted to raise. So lunchtime, so you want to hear me or to eat? I, I'd like to. No, basically the next slides are just describing the API, the implementation uh, itself. Is, uh, the implementation itself is on the list anyway. The ne next slide are not going deeply into the uh, details of the implementation, just the API and the usage. So long, my laptop went to sleep. <laughs> okay, so, so here's the API. Like, um, like again, like we said, uh, the, the 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 importing uh, process has its own context, and then using the uh, FD, he like to uh, import a specific uh, PD from this uh, context. So the API looks like this. The first argument is the context of the process that's created by the process. Uh, second argument is the FD that was passed by the SCM right why socket. It happen when the FD is shared? When you share the FD, you have a process, why don't you give it full access? Well, this is, yeah, this this is, is the this discussion. You yeah. don't want to share the whole FD because you can't control resource cleanup properly. It it's so they want to share objects, which is like weird. It yeah. is, yeah. So, so with this model, the importing process can have its own resources independent 
from the other <coughs> context. But, but the, the FD that we provide here is not the FD, the original yeah. FD, it's like a middle no, FD? It's a middle FD. Okay. It's, yeah. So you I mean, what, what do I mean? It's the EFD, the, the uh, original process, correct? Right. Well, I mean, there's lots of ways to use an API like this. The, the, this simply lets you copy a U object from one FD to another. So you can you can build all sorts of weird things <coughs> about that. You can share the parent one, the global one. You can share it to everybody, and you can just copy, and then resource <laughs> cleanup will work correctly. You could you could make it, I don't know, you could create a third FD and pass the third FD, and then it just has what's supposed to be passed. I, I I have no idea. Yeah, you yeah, probably yeah. don't want a third FD. That's well, complex. the third FD helps so the receiving process will not be able to access all the resources yeah. of the parent, just the limited ones. If that I was, was your willing security model, but I think we've established they don't have yeah, that security that's model. That was, by the way, his first approach. Like he created an, uh, an, a new FD just to export the object that we like. Okay. So here is the same one. We have only two: one that holds the objects to share, and one of the process itself. And that's it, that's the API. The import MR looks more or less the same. So the idea here is that you import the MR and then you use the same API to destroy it and then the objects keep reference counting so we are safe. Second process can die or kill it explicitly. The object, we still, uh, the, I, the IB object is still alive. So like I said, it's a big complicated mess to put the ref counting into the thing that was never meant to have ref counting like this. But the systematic is that both processes uh, have full control of the objects that they're sharing. This is not only the case here. No, they still have full control of the object they're sharing. I mean, you have to import the stuff and activate it. And yeah, well, you, you and import, once you import it. What, you what do I mean full control? They cannot dispose the, um, the object itself, just the user object, the U, U object. They can truncate it by full Oh, okay, okay. Th but, that's, that's but, that's but that's fine. fine. Yeah, that's what we talked. Like, if you want to share the amount, the memory itself should be anyway be be shared. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. They are trusted. So I, that's what I mean. Like, there is no security issue. Mm -hmm. We just want to keep the system safe, so one process cannot kill other process uh, resource. So, so um, maybe we ask a question for Jason. So here when we import the MR, we want to some way provide the PD to prove that we are allowed to import the MR because it's part of the tree. Yeah, that's where it gets all messy. Somebody has to prove that. I don't know who, if that should be done implicitly or explicitly or what, but somebody has to prove that the PD can still be referenced. Well, the entire graph can be referenced. You mean if you're using only the import yeah, PD, so but you didn't I, No, I, I just called import MR. I have the FD. I have the uh, handle to the MR, but I left the PD behind. I didn't uh, even uh, import uh, it. Uh, yeah. So somebody has to check that I imported the PDs yeah. in order to allow me to import the, the, the You have to check it. The, the who, who is you? What do you mean? Uh, the, the kernel has yeah. to pr make sure that when you import yeah, an MR, the key, no? that's you not enough. The key. You have to prevent it from being removed from the IDR until all of its children in the dependency yeah. graph are removed. So you can't have the semantic where you can, del you, you can't take something out of the local IDR. You just can't. So it's like it's a, it's a graph and we want to import part of the graph, part of the tree into my process. I, I, I can try and cherry pick. Uh, I mean, if I try and take a QP, I'm not talking about the data path and state stuff. QP is pointing <coughs> to a CQ. Wait, do I take the CQ first? Wait, do I take? I don't yeah. think it helps. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it does. It, that's not the problem. It's not the IDR that's the problem. It's the lifetime of the yeah, this but now uh, cloned once view oh, object. Once you are you are using two IDRs, you can uh, actually manage uh, lifetime of this object. Uh, because no. you already separated well, we can't shared object we and cannot have not two IDRs objects. because we only have one number space. So that's impossible. Right. And what is it, ah. it's a lifetime problem. <laughs> it's worse than I thought when we first discussed this. It's well, a lot worse than I thought. So so uh, can we get back to if if your application can just share the context by sharing the file descriptor, would that solve these problems. Well, but we just determined it can't. 
Why? It solves the import problem, but we're stuck with the... We're stuck with the cleanup problem now. Yeah. Well, but the, I still think the cleanup problem could be an application problem, and we could maybe provide some additional things that would be nice to use, but if they don't use them, then it, then they, they you know, crash. Because, you know, somebody destroyed their memory region underneath them. I don't know if we can make it an application what problem. What's the cleanup problem? So it, um, if I shared in the in the model we discussed previous, so I shared the FD, mm -hmm. both processes have access to the same U context. Right. Um, so basically I have a single uh, or maybe a reference count uh, PD in the kernel, mm -hmm. and both processes have it. Now, one process died. Yeah. So the reference on the FD is down, yeah. but the reference on the PD is not down. Maybe that process also created a QP on that PD. So n nobody's going to clean up the QP because the FD is still alive. Right, but, but the QP should be associated with the uh, common uh, PD, right? So well, that's, that, that's no, exactly but the PD, it's associated but the, with the common PD, but logically it's associated with that process. Yeah. yeah. So, so now you have 3,000 or 30,000 processes that created a PD. They all die beside the parents, and you have 30,000 QP ghosts, CQs, living there. A PD with a reference is not a yeah. big deal. But, but those would all be the uh, dependency of the FD on all the local objects. So, so once the FD on all the processes get closed, those would get cleaned up. Yeah, it's but not that's not that's not their model. So the Shmem model, no. in the Shmem model, if something goes wrong, you just restart the entire cluster, basically, I guess, not just the machine. In their model, if one process dies, they want to just reincarnate it yeah. and continue and let the rest of the system continue. And, and it's imperative that you have PDs for every process. No, a global PD is what they want. Right. So, see, that would be. I think the purpose is really the MRs, not not the PDs by themselves. It's just sure. that you need the PD to get access to the MR. Yeah, but so you you need the PD to get access to the MR. Right. You can't create a QP without a PD. Right. And you need to create your QP on the correct PD. So it's about sharing MRs, really. It's uh, but yeah. uh, but the shared PD kind of comes. It's inevitable. <laughs> it's inevitable. It's inevitable. PD. So I I don't know. You need a way to. to and that's because there is too few MRs available. So, <laughs> I'm having another idea that's a little available. worse. What is worse, uh, import or the cleanup? The cleanup. So, if we accept that the import is too hard because of the graph problems and so forth, we have we really, really have problems. We have more than one U object. If we could manage this ref count thing with another file descriptor, maybe, then when that file descriptor could be isolated to the process and could be cleaned up. We could trigger a kernel cleanup of the segment, the, uh, like a weird, weird way to do it. But it's not impossible. But it's sort of a model. It it's sort of a model where you create a new U file that's like a subset, a, a strict subset of somebody else's U context. It's kind of weird. Maybe it could, I don't know. But in some, some way, you already have this sharing if you have a common process with multiple threads, right? Yeah, yeah. And oh, you, can, you can do with, with something with the, with the clone flags. The sharing, <laughs> the sharing isn't the problem. It's, it's, either, it's either getting them to be there, which we can do with shared FD, or it's cleaning them up when the objects that are not shared go away. In the thread model, you have, a, you have a, the, clean up, the clean up works, right? The thread model, the application has to do it. If one of your threads malfunctions and exits, then then the application is responsible for cleaning up any resources. We're logically if I kill the thread. process, it will, it will be cleaned up, right? Yes. So the, the, the operation system has the ability, Linux has the ability to yes. clean the stuff up. It so cleans up everything. That needs to be preserved. It it would be preserved. We have yeah. So so when you have multi-process, if one process oh. dies, you just want to bring this up. You don't want to call the kill the entire service on that machine, because if you kill the all the processes. Mm -hmm. Cleanup will happen nicely, but but you don't want to. You yeah, want but in, in, in the threat model, you need the threat can die, and the process will continue. Other threats will continue. But, but if it caused, if this thread uh, did something bad and the process dies, everything will be cleaned up. If the thread dies, so that's another option. The the IPC between the processes. If I create something on one process, I'll tell the parent process, so it somehow knows to decrement the ref count on behalf. That, that I the don't process think... process will not have this, uh, the chance to send anything. Well, I don't think Maybe. we can do that without races. It has to be done by the kernel in a way that's free of races. 
So you can't, you can't, this is what I was saying to Ira, you can't really delegate this to the application mm -hmm. and have a correct application. The kernel has to manage this somehow. And if you say, if you're saying you're sharing a single, if you're saying you're sharing a single FD, then the kernel needs to understand that some objects need to be destroyed when a process exits. That's just what they need to make cleanup work correctly. So you need some way to bind some subset of objects to the lifetime of a process, which is another FD. So inevitably we get to two FDs. Because that's the only object in the kernel that can bind to a lifetime of a process. It's an FD that, no, that no, a driver no, should no, be no. touching with, right? We shouldn't be screwing around with other things. Uh, the FD can refer to an inode or to something else, yeah, whatever yeah, you want. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can manage that object to do yeah. it. Destroy everything you need. It's not the only way it's done. It. So, so it's the way a driver should do it. So, so Jason, actually, the, the import API looks similar. So I'm, I'm, I have a, a context which is shared. I'm pulling the handle out of this context. And I'm just giving you another FD that I somehow created, saying that this handle I'm reconstructing on a new object, on a, associated with an additional FD, I know, but, I but know, it has but to be on a, on a this QP, is creating a, CQ and everything. This is creating a different problem where we, can't, we can no longer reliably destroy our hardware objects because user space can create situations where the right dependencies don't exist in the objects I'm trying to destroy. This, this is a weird quirk of how our system works. Kevin, how do you keep you clean up? Is this a problem? I, I have yet to think of a way to clean it up. It's a, so fundamentally, we have a graph of objects. And you have to do your object destroys in a bottom-up fashion from that graph. And it can be done, can be done in an automatic way. We have an automatic way. We go over the, the list of things multiple times and essentially destroy it bottom-up. It's It works. It's fine. But it depends on the entire graph being part of the list, the same list. Mm -hmm. So if you say, oh, I'm going to take that list, I'm going to split it up, mm -hmm. well, now you got a problem because you, you have a portion of the graph. You can't destroy a portion if the, it's the wrong portion. Right. Or it's interlinked with the graph on the other side. It's a problem. It's a big mess. And then the graph is specific for each process, right? Today, yeah. Today, yeah. So I think the only answer is you have to share the whole graph always. Or you create a separate graph that's a split P from both of them and it's managed separately. We can't do that. We can't have a shared PD with that. So some of the objects are shared between the both graphs. That's, Why do you need it? That's, just, that's just how it is. The, the PD has to be shared. Yeah, well, you probably have, have to have some kind of intermediate uh, process structure that sh is associated with both. It's associated with a file handle. I mean, it manages as a state that you have shared. It does, none of that matters. At the end of the day, the hardware object for a PD must exist in both processes, must exist in yes. both graphs, and it has to be exactly the same object. And if I want to destroy that PD object, I can't unless I've destroyed all of the children in both of the processes, Yes. which is a big problem. That's a big problem for our model. Can you handle the lower level? I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Then, then you get to a uh, vendor specific problem. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, so this has gone in a really bad direction. We no longer have any solution. Yeah, this, the ultimate solution is shut down the devices and restart them. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, then you have a known state. <laughs> but in case you have two devices. So you're used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if we, we, we have the okay. Windows model. We just reboot every night. Well, I think we're well over time, so <laughs> I think <laughs> the food. It's lunch. Uh, oh, hold on, one more, one more. No, no, one more. Uh, like uh, Shamira has posted like a huge uh, patch set, and then I split it into three patch sets. The first one is lucky preparation. Uh, I didn't see any more comments on that. So, is it like is it acceptable? It's like a cleanup patches set. It's not related to the shared PD. Any? I I didn't see any any objections. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> any comments on on the on on this patch set? So. It's a pet set. It's already sent there. Uh, yeah. I don't know that. What, that's why it's I'm already asking. been submitted, but I, I can only speak for myself. I saw it on there, but I really haven't had the time to look it over and, and review it closely. Oh, I okay. dropped it off password immediately. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was. But it's not so okay. It was not his fault. No, it's 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 as many fundamental, many major things that are wrong. Oh, I got my own box. <laughs> like, it, right? No new write interfaces is like fundamental. We're not doing write interfaces anymore. So all new new user APIs have to be ioctal. I'm just going off what he says. I, I'm saying I, there was sort of I can't remember there was some other yeah. big. There's too many patches. They weren't ordered right. They didn't compile. Some of those have been fixed. But I think he's asking specifically just of the cleanup that you object. Oh, that one. Okay, that one I haven't taken off of Patchwork. That See, one. That, that's right. Off. That that that, that eight patch, patch series or whatever is still there. I think that yeah, one. I kind any of walk I will continue to do whether in, with Alex or not. So it's that based one. On that. Now that we've had this discussion, I don't even want to move forward with that one until we have an answer for how we're going to handle cleanup. And that will guide how we have to do the reference counting. And the reference counting scheme you got developed in that patch doesn't seem to solve the cleanup problem, I'm afraid. No, I mean cleanup like the, uh, to separate the U objects pointers from the ID object. I mean that when I go and destroy a U file, I'm going to destroy all the U hardware associated with it, and that kind of has to work somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we'll do. Maybe maybe the ref counts solve it. I'm not sure. Can you create special devices? I'm <laughs> not sure. <laughs> I have to think about it. <laughs> I think we'll have to think about it. <laughs> to the lunch. That's it? Them? All right. So basically, you have to check the security model to start with, if we can go either way. And you have to do homework and see uh, how, how we solve, come up with a one solution, yeah. Yeah, promise to do that. Okay, let's have lunch, Neil. That's it. No, after lunch, you cannot uh, really think. <laughs>